All right, welcome to the Crew Show. Larry Kruger, Dan Coach Amelia, Ryan Smith, and our special guest tonight, former Giants assistant GM, former Dodgers GM, longtime friend of the show, longtime friend of yours truly, the great Ned Coletti in the house. Ned, good to see you. Thanks for joining us uh, tonight on the Krug Show. We appreciate it. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you guys, too. Kind of a crazy day up there, huh? Very crazy day, very wild day, um, you know, and this has been a very, a very difficult day for Giants fans um, because the Giants had a deal worked out with Carlos Correa and then they were ready to have the press conference yesterday. And then three hours prior to the press conference, they, they canceled the press conference and um, and there were a lot of a lot of speculation what was going on and the people i think at that point weren't even 100% sure that the press conference was related to carlos correa but they had yet to have the press conference uh, welcoming correa after signing a 13 year 350 million dollar deal but the deal fell through in the 11th hour and we believe it fell through due to um the physical scott boris the agent for carlos correa Um, gave some comments to Susan Slusser of the Chronicle and Ken Rosenthal from the athletic. He just said, we reached an agreement. We had a letter of agreement. We gave them a time frame to execute it. They advised us. They still had questions. They still wanted to talk to other people, other doctors go through it. I said, look, I've given you a reasonable time. We need to move forward on this. Give me a time frame. And if you're not going to execute, I need to go talk with other teams and then supposedly, according to Boris, there was a 12-hour period where um, the Giants kind of ghosted him and didn't call him back. And then he moved on to the Mets and worked out a a uh, 12-year deal, not a 13-year deal, a 12-year deal for $315 million with the Mets freewheeling owner, Steve Cohen. Um, and so now Carlos Correa is a member of the Mets and the Giants – who made a huge public stance that they were going to make a big play in the off season, a dramatic splash are splashless. They swung and missed for Aaron judge. They've now had a deal with Carlos Correa go South. Um, And where do they go from here? What happened? They have not, the giants have not released a statement saying anything other than um, they, you know, are moving on from the player and, and that's that's that. But they have not made any explanation as to what exactly. Now, um, why don't we jump into the conversation right there, Ned? What do you, what's your read before we lead you in any direction? This is a job that you did, and you've negotiated these jo- these ma- massive baseball contracts for a living, and you dealt with Scott Boris, um, which is more than Ryan or Dan or I can say. So, well, we'll Dan we'll did you- come in fifth in our fantasy league. That's true, and Dan does live in a 55 and over community. That's Hope there are more than five teams. There's some tough negotiators in Del Boca Vista uh, that's where right. Danny that's resides. Right. Um, no, but Ned, give give us your read on this right from the from afar because I know that you're probably watching this from afar, and you've dealt with Boris, so you kind of understand what the Giants and uh, the Giants at least have been dealing with as far as on that side of the table. What's your what's your thought on it? Well. I can see where a deal could not happen because of a player not not passing a physical. Um, I can understand that. Rare? No doubt rare because there's so much due diligence done way before you even have to call the agent. Teams have, they can, they can I should say, they can call the agent before they negotiate, express an interest, have the agent express an interest back, and receive all the medical. We can get into that in a little a little while here, but the the part that is is surprising to me is the press conference part. Um, teams have the right to to walk away from a deal if they don't if they're not satisfied with the physical. That's unusual, but that's part of the deal. At the same time, and I don't, and again, I guess nobody really announced what the press conference was about. But to schedule a press conference and then to go, you know, take it off the board and have a player go elsewhere in the next few hours, 
I don't know that I've ever seen that happen, especially of the magnitude of, of the player we're talking about. So um, tremendously different, in my opinion, and interesting. But again, you know, teams have the right to take the deal off the table if they're not satisfied with the physical. But to schedule a press conference, unless they were going to announce something else that they decided not to announce, to me, that's that's very unusual. And I don't know if somebody got cold feet. I don't know if, um, you know, surmising that the press conference was uh, to introduce this player. I don't know if, uh, if there was a difference of opinion between the baseball side and the ownership side. Um, you know, they had a lot of time since this was announced. This was announced eight or nine days ago, I think. A week, exactly a week. A week ago. Okay, you know, that's, that's a lot of time to get something in motion um, because you know the time of year. You know players are flying off the board. Both the player is losing opportunities and, and the team is losing opportunities. And as you stated, you know, they, they came into this offseason, you know, explaining where they were at budgetarily and that they had a chance to do some big things. And, you know, Aaron Judge was probably always going back to the Yankees despite him showing up at a Bay Area airport one day. Who knows, you know, how that was orchestrated or what. But, uh, you know, this this is a very unusual situation. And um, until there, I guess, is explanation, I think there's going to be nothing but speculation. Let me throw a few out, and then I'll let the, the boys uh, jump in here. Um, let's talk about the medicals for a second. A guy becomes a free agent. When When do the teams get – the medical information and is it possible that the giants didn't have access to, to um, you know, the medical information, all of the medical information on the player until very recently. I mean, um, very, very unusual. Most of the time when free agency, when the window opens and a team, especially a team like the giants, you know, high end, big market, iconic uh, when they would inquire about a player of this, of this type, certainly the agent can give them a password, give them a key and they can go in and, and um, check out all the medical. They can check out MRIs. They can check out x-rays. They can check out training room notes. They can see exactly where the player has been. And as San Diego found out a few years ago, it's stuff you have to be truthful with. You can't be hiding stuff. You can't be keeping two sets of books. And so teams, before they before I would engage with an agent, I would have that reviewed by my medical staff to see if it was even worth us going forward. And so chances are they had access to that. I would be surprised if they didn't have access to that. But that's, that's a typical way of, of doing your due diligence. Um, so I would, you know, and it, it's not... You're going to have a, a letter of agreement that is going to be contingent. All terms will be contingent on the player passing a physical at the at the team's medical the, the, with their doctors, with their orthopedics across the board. That is all standard, and that you know the the information you can learn from the the medical notes from the previous teams give you a, a guidepost to to kind of figure out. Just something you need to look deeper into uh, if the player is a no right out of the gate, all those types of things. The physical is the final. That, that's going to tell you the story. Uh, should it take seven or eight days to do? No, but I mean, who knows what people have got on their schedule. Um, at the same time, you know, it's, it's just unusual to have, have this go the way it went, where, the way it went, when it went, and how it went. But yeah, teams usually have access to the medical as soon as they make contact with the agent and the agent has the interest and the player has the interest in coming to that team. Stand- and one, one of the things that I saw, I heard today and somebody whispered to me that, um, that the medicals for Korea, you know, may have been, you know, the, the, let's say, you know, the report coming out of the, out of the physical may have prevented the giants on their end from ensuring the contract. Um, and that might have been the, the the straw that broke the back as far as making them want to back out of the deal. How many con? I mean, you know, major league contracts and major league teams. These big mo- big money contracts. Do the owners take out insurance on these deals? And 
um, wouldn't has that ever entered into the time frame and how these deals become public? And do you ever have to, hey, you know what, Ned? I know you're ready to announce the deal, but let's not announce it yet because we want to see if we can get insurance on this contract, and we don't have that those that information yet. So we don't want to go forward until we know that we can insure the the player's contract or some portion there of it. Um, well, are that's, you familiar with that? Oh, yeah. That, that's something that, that I hadn't heard in the last 24, 48 hours. Um, you know, it's, it's very possible. Look, teams will insure players' contracts. Typically how it works, not always, but typically how it works, it's going to be a high premium. And most insurance companies will not insure a pre-existing condition, a pre-existing injury. If a pitcher had Tommy John surgery or had labrum repair or something like that, that shoulder is not going to be insurable. Okay, And the way it, it can work is you've got 183 days in a season. Um, sometimes the insurance will not start until a player has missed half that time. It's an odd number, so it's not going to be exactly half, but 90, 91, 92 days. Those first 90 to some 92 days, that's on the club. After that, then the insurance can start to kick in. Not at 100%, maybe at 80%. It depends, like any insurance that we all buy, it depends on, on how much you want to pay for the right. Some teams can probably get 50% back, some teams 70%, some teams 80% typically after the halfway point that a player has missed. And, and that could very well be. Now, Correa has played a lot of games the last three years. I think he missed two during the 60-game season. He's missed not very many the last two seasons. Does that prohibit an insurance company from saying, hey, uh, we're not going to insure the back? Because I think he had a back issue way back when? Possibly. Possibly. Or be prohibitive to do it. So, yeah, that is – that is a, a, um, a consideration without a doubt. That could be a huge consideration. And like I say, you know, a team's got the right to walk away from the deal. That they would announce a press conference ahead of it is where it gets, it gets quirky to me because, you know, it, it, you either are or you're not. You know, and as far as deals go, um, and I, I talked to so much media today because of this, both you know, on, on both coasts and in both uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles. And a lot of the media who I dealt with in L.A., they, they kind of laughed a little bit, not because of the predicament, but because all the time when we would have a deal almost in place, and there's no such thing really as almost in place, you either have a deal or you don't have a deal. I would say we don't have a deal. When we have a deal, we'll announce the deal. But just because you're getting facts and figures and terms from an agent or from another source doesn't mean we have a deal. And so media would get on me once in a while and say, well, everybody knows you're going to do this deal. Why don't you just announce it? Well, the reason is because we weren't finished with the physical. And so and, until you get to that point, you don't have a deal. And again, I don't know what who released what on this particular situation, but I think it's, it's typically in the agent and the player's benefit to leak it someplace. And I'm not saying that happened because I have no idea how it got out there. But whoever decided to put the 13 and the 350 in the public domain, you know, is, is probably protecting the player to some extent because it's tough to walk it back. Once you once it's out there, I mean, look at the, the excitement that was caused in San Francisco. I have no idea if anybody printed up shirts or memorabilia or things like that. They actually had a ticket package out there with this picture on there selling, okay, you know, so selling it, some tickets. You know, yeah. that's, you can't you can't put the heart in the, the the cart in front of the horse. It doesn't go. I would never make I would never announce a deal until we had a deal. And there's no such thing as being close. You either do or you don't. And until that physical is approved, you don't, in my opinion. All right. Let me jump in on the Giants for a second, because you know the Giants. Wait, also, Larry, are, are we gonna wait until the end to get all these super chats? Because I do feel yeah, a little bad. Absolutely. It's, we will get in, we'll get as soon as we get we'll we'll okay. get into a little break here in a bit and we'll we'll go through the super chats quickly at that okay. point. And we do appreciate everybody for for their questions. And we will if you you know if you throw your super chats in there, we definitely will have a segment and we'll get to all of them. We absolutely will. Uh, but I want to get a little get a, Ned, you know, to get a little out here before we get into that. Uh, you know the giant front office, and you got to know the giant ownership group. 
when you were you and Brian were building those several teams that you built as the, him as the GM, you as the assistant GM, did you talk to? Was there one point of contact in the ownership group too? Was it any of the thirty partners could call you at any time? Because here's my here's my what I believe from from just being an educated observer, and I have no sources. Um, I really believe a couple things are going on here. I think the I think the Giants knew that they need to make a big splash, both in the box office and and talent wise on their roster. Had cleared the money, were prepared to spend it. Uh, went after Judge. Obviously, he's the toast in New York and opted to stay there. Nothing surprising about that uh, in the slightest, really. Uh, I mean, you're the toast in New York. Who leaves? Then they pivot to Correa. They give Correa a $350 million deal. I really believe that, that you know, and, um, Chris Russo, is, who's a, you know probably one of the biggest uh, media guys in the country when it comes to baseball and a hard, hardcore Giants fan and a friend of many Giants uh, executives and owners and that kind of thing came out and didn't just rip it, Ned. He basically called it the worst deal in the history of the franchise. I have to think that he's held in such high regard that there's some owner that may have gotten a little nervous and may have voiced some concern about this deal. Then they gave it a week, right? Exactly a week before they, they, they were going to have this press conference. I, my hunch, and I'm, this is just a hunch is that they were thinking big thoughts about ticket sales with Aaron judge and Carlos Correa, while he's a terrific player and a proven player, I don't, I don't think he moves the needle ticket wise. And I think they might've been shocked by the reaction of Russo and some of the negative reaction and comments about the deal and how, how it was going to be ugly on the back end, stared at that and then looked at the lack of ticket sales uh, for the upcoming season over the course of a week, and we're looking for a way out. And I believe that that they may have – I'm hearing that what they didn't like wasn't anything about a back, that it was about a, an injury from the minor leagues involving an ankle. But this is an eight-year player in the majors who's played a lot of baseball and is kind of a proven commodity at this point in every way imaginable. So I, I kind of believe, and I'd have to be convinced otherwise, that they just got cold feet and were looking for a reason to get out of the contract. I'm just kind of wondering from your years dealing with the Giants, have do are the owners all united? Would they contact you independently? And there might be some random 25th owner who's like, I really don't like this deal. Did you speak only to one person? Is there any chance that, that from where you're sitting that maybe the Giants just got cold feet about the term and the dollars and the total spend. And this was an Avenue to kind of back away from the deal and, and get out of the commitment. What do you think? Well, it, it's, it's certainly a possibility and I can't speak to how the ownership is set up. I've been gone for quite a while now in the, in my tenure there, the, the way the offices were set up, it was Peter McGowan, Larry bear, myself and Brian. And We'd have numerous conversations with Larry and Peter all the time. They knew where we were on, on every deal. There was, there was no, no mystery to it as, as the people who owners, representative of ownership, uh, had the right to know. And we were always involved. You know, we signed Barry twice during my tenure. Uh, Jeff Kent, we signed. Numerous pitchers we signed. Long-term, Robbie Nen with Scott. Uh, actually, Barry was represented by Scott when we did the five-year deal after he hit the 73 home runs. You know, there was there was no no time at all that you went. I think Barry signed for maybe 90, 92 million. It's not like uh, you know we told him, oh, we're at 30, and then uh, the day before we're ready to do it. Oh, we're up to 90. No, I mean all the steps were were discussed. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we before we could make a step especially at that magnitude, and talk about 350 million. There's a chance that, that those who are, are in, in the decision-making group knew step-by-step step and approved step-by-step step until they got to a point that, they, that this was what they were willing to do. Um, so that is, that's what I could tell you. I don't know how they do it today. Um, there were many owners, many great people that I was friends with and still communicate with from time to time. But I, I think it was really Peter and Larry, and then they would take it to the board. They had a smaller board, an inner circle of that group that I think maybe changed annually. 
uh, and some people, uh, Harmon Burns, for sure, the, the late Harmon Burns, a tremendous guy, along with the late Peter McGowan. You know, he was probably in on every move as well, knowing what the thought process was. I think every ownership group is different. But I think that in, in this case, it, it's, it's probably at least somewhat similar to that. But you know, ownership wasn't, I don't think they would be surprised that this deal was of the magnitude it was. I think at the end of the day, they, they had to approve it and may have told Farhan, this is what we want to do. I mean, I have no idea. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes I had to hold ownership back a little bit, not in San Francisco, you know, because it, 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 to me, it didn't make sense. And, you know, so sometimes, you know, you got to have that conversation. That doesn't mean you don't do it if they want you to do it. But sometimes ownership is, uh, has a different viewpoint than, than the baseball ops people. And, yeah, what, what you say, I mean, could very well have happened because, you know, I was taken aback by it. You called me that night and said, hey, could you go on, come on the show? Right. I was doing a charity thing down in Newport. And, and I said, how much, you know, what's the deal? And I, I was, I was taken aback by that. And this by is the, what by the, for, by the number of years, years, 13 years. Um, yeah. The, I, was, yeah. You know, I, I think I said it to you before we went on the air, like, whoa, you know, so maybe, maybe that's what happened, but you know, it's, we can speculate all we want, I guess a fact and I'm going to go back to it. A fact that, that uh, stymies me or, or really I find interesting is you're going to have a press conference and you're, then you're not. And Ned, it's not just that. Uh, two more tidbits that came out afterwards in the SI reporting were, <laughs> well, first of all, I, I was listening to KMBR. Marcus and Marcus were on for uh, Murph and Mac. They had an 8.30 scheduled with Carlos Correa. 8.30 a.m. They were going to be the first one. They woke up fully expecting it. And then last second, they, you know, it, he, he couldn't show. And apparently in the SI article, Correa, when he heard the news, he was already fully dressed like to the nine in uh, like a, you know, a suit and all that kind of stuff ready for the press conference. So, so he was in San Francisco. Yeah. And apparently Boris gave him uh, or gave the, uh, gave the giants until 1 PM um, to sign the, with the agreement so that like, it's all just pending, you know, that he can't talk to any other teams and then it's just pending physical. And they said, sure. And then they just never heard back. I mean, yeah, uh, I also Chapman, heard, go ahead, Danny, you, I'm sure you want to, I heard jump from in. Alex uh, Pavlovich article that, uh, in fact, Marty Lurie's quoted in the article that it was not the back they were concerned about, but it was the ankle that he fractured in 2014 in the minors and had to have uh, surgery, had a, a fractured tibia and a ligament damage. And somehow that came up to me. That just sounds disingenuous because he's been playing in the league for what seven, eight years. <laughs> just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Dak Prescott had that, like, you know, his entire ankle and everything shattered and he's playing again this year. I got to say this, Ned. After today and yesterday, I think you and Brian and Peter McGowan. The three of you go down as three of the greatest non-baseball players in Giants history. I mean, you guys changed the franchise. I've been a Giants fan since the 60s, late 60s. And I went through the Horace Stoneham years where he was broke and had to basically traded Willie Mays for some cash and a player, Charlie Williams. Um, the 70s and were awful. They didn't win a pennant until... 87, 71, and then 87. And then you guys came around in 94. And man, it was like 97 on. You guys were the top five teams in baseball consistently. So I just personally want to thank you for being a part of Giants history, uh, a beautiful, wonderful part of Giants history that uh, you and Brian brought to the Bay Area. Thank you. <coughs> Suck up. Well, I'm I'm taken aback by the comment. That I, <laughs> I'm humbled by it. Thank you. I, I, well, no, I, I yeah. I'm as, I've been a Brian fan. Was, I, Brian that's was enough. Lost. That's enough. Was, we got to mute was, Dan. We got to mute Dan. I was, right the, there. I was the assistant, you know, and uh, you know my time there was always going to be precious to me. You know, we uh, we did a lot of cool things, including moving out of Candlestick Park down to the beautiful ballpark. So 
uh, a lot of things transpired and, and it was tough for me to leave, but again, it was a general manager's job. So, uh, you know, I wasn't, you know, yeah, no, that's, and that's, that. that's no it suck great, up. I'm just totally today. I was just like, this is about as down as I've ever been as a giants fan, because it's not so much losing Correa. It's the fact that the future, who's going to want to sign here now. I mean, what player in their right mind and agent is going to want to deal with this? It's like a clown show to me. Ned, Danny's a beaten man. He's a beaten man at this point. He, he needs some. He needs someone to pick him up. He needs a pick me up. Well, I'm not sure I can. I can do that. I, I think the. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's a good point you bring up too because, you know, free agents may be a little bit wary, at least for a while. And, you know, sometimes that's going to cost you more. You may have to outbid everybody to be sure that you're going to get, you know, but again, you know, people, money talks. So if there's a deal out there that, that they're going to pay a lot for a player, they'll end up signing that player. But what I'm, you know, what I'm waiting to see, I guess, a little bit is, and uh, I talked about this earlier today on, on a couple different shows, you know, the O2 team, which, uh, you know, Brian Dusty were the, the two main leaders and I was the assistant GM. You know, we go to game seven of the World Series and we get beat. And when we get to spring training in 03, there's no Jeff Kent. There's no Russell Ortiz. I think LeVon Hernandez was also gone. And uh, you know, guys in the clubhouse looked around and says, we have less than we ended with? And we, and we went to the seventh game of the World Series? So players know it's almost like at the at the trading deadline when you have a chance to win and a team doesn't do something. It's tough for the players to get up and continue to go forward with that. And I think that, you know, there may be some of that. We'll, we'll wait and see how spring training goes and how the beginning of the season goes. But you got to believe that the players were excited that this that this player was coming to this city uh, and today probably disappointed that he's not. You know, players don't like to lose. And when you got a, an all-star and a, a top-end talent, you know, you get excited about that. It puts a little jump in everybody's step. Well, you know, that ain't happening. What is the damage going forward? I mean, um, are the are they are the Giants damaged with Boris? Are they damaged with agents? Are they damaged um with in the eyes of players i mean you've done this job and you know you're you're keenly aware of the industry and all the different pressure points based on the you saw what happened today they they backed out of a deal um obviously they claimed something in some medical issue the, obviously the mets didn't feel that that medical issue was was too much for them to pay a 12 year agreement to the player so now a new team steps in and the giants move to the side so if you were in charge what what happened today? Give for for those of us who aren't privy to the game and don't know the ins and outs. Where were the Giants damaged? Where would you be concerned about the uh, uh, like a lasting effect of not just losing out in Korea? Because some people think they dodged a bullet with the player. I'm one of them. I wouldn't have gone more than eight years with that player, and I think he's great. I wouldn't have given him 13 years. I think they dodged a bullet with the player, but I think there's they've been damaged today as an organization in the eyes of probably players, agents, GMs, and I don't think they're getting any bargains and trades from uh, other GMs or on the free agent market from agents, but you've played, you've done the game. So what do you think, Ned? Where's the damage here? Well, they're, they're not in a position of strength right now. I mean, they have a, they have a big budget and they have, they have capital to, to do something with, but they're not in a position of strength. They, they went from 107, 108 wins to, you know, I'm not sure whether they win 80, 82, 83. They won five. Something. They were 500. Exactly. Okay, they won 81 games. So, you know, that's a pretty, that's a pretty big fallback. And, you know, I know the team fairly well. I see him play all the time. And, you know, it's, it's not like I think they're as good as San Diego or the Dodgers and the Dodgers have lost a lot of players too. I think those two teams are, are very much beyond San Francisco at this point. So they're not in a position of strength to do deals, to make moves at this time. You know, your free agency, you know, it's easy to say all it costs you is money, so to speak, and maybe a draft pick or something like that at, at different levels. But, you know, it's tougher to get a high-end player from another team. I mean, that that is tough to do unless you've got a farm system that is just, you know, the greatest in, in 
uh, of anybody's. And, and I'm not sure that's a, you know, a, an accurate assessment of, of this one. So, you know, they're not in a position of strength. Does it, does it damage them as far as the agent business and things like that? You know, we can't, we can never forget. This is a, this is a ruthless business on both sides. And teams have lost players. Teams have signed players to long-term deals. And maybe they, they didn't catch an injury there. They didn't do, you know, this goes both ways all the time. And it's going it, to, it falls on both sides. And it, it behooves everybody. It behooves an agent to make the best deal they can make for their client, whether it's location, whether it's uh, caliber of team, caliber of ownership, years, dollars. It's incumbent upon that agent to do what is best for the player. Okay. And it's incumbent on the team to do what's best for the team. So will a team go back to an agent that's burned them? Sure. If they've got the right player and they need the player, sure they will. And will an agent go back to a team that's burned them or has burned somebody else? Sure they will. If that's the best deal that they can make and that's where the player wants to be. So, you know, that there's probably a little bit of, of eyebrow raising and, a little bit of residual from something like this where players are going to be curious as to, you know, how this go, how did this happen? I thought this guy was signed, you know, to now he's, now he's in a, he's across the country, you know? So there is probably a little bit of that, but we can't forget that this is a business that has got a ruthless piece to it because of the competition factor that exists. And yeah, there's a lot of agents that, that I felt burned me from time to time. Doesn't mean I wasn't going to do business with them if they had the right player. And I'm sure that there's on the other side of the fence, there's a, the same type of argument. You know, I've had all sorts of deals with, with Scott, some good, some great, some brutal. And, you know, and he and I had a, I think an, an honest relationship for probably 25 or so years. And when I started doing TV, we'd run into each other before a game or during a game and, and have a nice cordial conversation because we no longer had to do business with each other. But make no mistake, it's, you know, an agent makes their living by representing players, not by helping teams. If they help the team, that's kind of a residual effect of something. They are there to do what the best they can for the player. And the team is there to do the best it can for the team. So you will cross that line and make a deal with somebody you'd rather not make a deal with because of some past history. But I don't think it stops people from doing it. At this point in the offseason, though, as you look at the Giants and you look at what they had intended to do and what they set out to do and what they had told the public they were going to try to do and didn't do, that to me has got more of an effect than the lasting effect on this. Are you what surprised the, that Boris quickly pivoted to the Mets or never, is he decisive that way? Never. He is um, – Again, I had many deals with him, some good, some bad, and you know, and some collaborative and and some without any, you know, ounce of collaboration. But I, I think he is the most prepared agent I've ever dealt with. He understands everybody's situation. He reads people very well. He reads situations very well. And he goes to the top whenever he can. Fortunately for for me in LA, I had Frank McCourt and, and Stan Kasten as the president, and, and they would not entertain those types of conversations. But you can go back to the Texas Rangers and Alex Rodriguez. That wasn't made with that deal was not made with the general manager. That was made with the owner. That historic deal. The deal that we just talked about with the Mets. That was not made with Mr. Epler. That was made with the owner. Do you so, think this deal was made by Farhan? What? Do you think Farhan made this deal, or do you think this is a Greg Johnson oh. giant ownership? Uh, the 13 350? You know, yeah. Um, I, I have no idea. I mean, Boros I, I assume did. that, that Farhan was the, the point person on the negotiation. I don't, Boros I don't actually know gave credit to uh, Greg Johnson for getting this deal done. Well, ownership is always going to have to have to say yes to the final number. So, you know, again, you know, we can. You know, words have many, many different meanings to them. You know, you, I would always credit yeah. ownership with helping me get every deal done. That doesn't mean they ever said a word to the agent. Right. So yeah. I think it's, you know, I, I, don't I think know he said he's something to the effect that he was pretty involved in it, though. Um, well, again, so, what, is, what does that mean? Yeah, who knows? Yeah. 
you know, Farhan yeah. kept him uh, appraised of every every step of the way, and and had he had a lot of interact. I mean, or or maybe he talked to Scott. I don't Ned, have any what, idea. All I know what, is that. What is your approach, Ned? You know, they're they're to, fluid and they're a little bit tough to define sometimes. What would your be? What would your approach be when you were the general manager and fans were expecting you know you to do something? Were you going to keep it? under your lips to yourself, what your goals were, or were you going to announce that to the media? <laughs> <You know>, I, <laughs> I think I know the answer to this one, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you, know, you better win, you know, for yeah. fans, I, you know, they, they, they fueled the game without the fans, there is no game. But again, if, uh, you know, like a, one of the great hall of fame managers of all time used to tell me, you listen to the fans, you'll be sitting with them. You know, so, you know, you, you don't do that. And I would I would never, ever lay out um, my expectations for we're going to have a big off season or we're going to make a major deal at the deadline. You have no control over that. And once you set that forward, everybody again, it's a ruthless business. So if you're a GM and, and, and some team says we're going to make a big deal at the deadline and that GM is blowing up your phone, you know, you know that, hey. I can get that other guy at A ball or double A, that high end prospect, because this cat's just, you know, he's, he's promised something that he may or may not be able to deliver. And the same thing in the offseason. I, I would never lay out expectations. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You know what? I'll wait and I'll announce it when we have a deal. And that's when we'll, that's how we'll do it. And we'll, we'll mind our own business and we'll just stay, stay focused on the goal ahead and the team ahead and, and how to build a winner. And that's that's all we ever concern ourselves with. My that, time in San Fran or yeah. my time down south. One that of makes the, the most uh, sense. Hold on, so one of the things that I think is kind of interesting you brought up there is there's a lot of reconnaissance there. Um, is that something that you yourself would do as the GM, or maybe you did when Brian was the GM and you were the assistant GM? Who's going through all these comments from different GMs to see exactly what they've said and what they're on record with? Did you guys have a staff of people that would say, hey, by the way, you know, do you guys know that, you know, this GM is on the record as saying that he will get something done before the end of the meetings and the meetings end tomorrow and they haven't done a thing. I mean, was, well, or is that so, all on you, Ned, to be be cognizant of all that yeah, dialogue? It, it fell on everybody to understand the business that they were in and to understand the competition and the thought process of the competition. You know, um, I was just talking to a, a, a longtime friend and a great player the other day and mentioned, you know, when I scouted, people think you scout from the national anthem until the last pitch of the game. That's minuscule. I scouted everybody every day, all over the place. My teams, their teams, minor leagues, front offices, ownerships. You knew what, what GMs were, as they say, are all hat and no cattle, you know, who would always just, you know, tell right. you a story and never do anything. And you knew the ones that were serious. Some guys I could have an hour long conversation with and get absolutely nowhere. Other guys like a Jimmy Hendry or a Doug Melvin or a Walt Jockety, guys like that. Uh, Kevin Towers, the late Kevin Towers. You know, it was within three minutes. We both knew where we were at. And if we were if we had a common interest or a chance to get something done. So it's, it's your it's your business to know it. If there's 365 days in a year, Brian Saban and I talked. 360 of them, if not more. So there was constant communication between us two, the late Dick Tidrow, who was such a, a major part of everything we did and the, the player, his player development and his scouting. And then, you know, young guys like Jeremy Shelley, who's still with the organization, who, you know, we depended on more and more to, to provide us with insight. But we'd, ha we'd talk all day long and have conversations and sit in his office where he had the big boards with, all the rosters of every team on it. And now I don't even know if that, that exists anymore because of the computer age, but we still do it. We still, it was like writing something down. You could see it with your own eyes. And so you knew where teams were at and you could always figure out where an ownership was at. Owners would come and tell you, you know, I was just at the owner's meeting. This team is looking to move some money They're They're under a little bit of distress or this team is going to be aggressive. That's your business. That This is your, your livelihood and your craft. So it was incumbent upon us to do our own homework and figure and figure it out. We didn't take somebody else's word for it outside the tiny, tiny circle. 
I had in LA or the tiny circle that Brian had in San Fran. This well, is I mean, a re- really interesting discussion. Go ahead, Ry. I'm a, okay, this is where I got to call massive BS on this whole thing is Pete Petulia has been was with the Astros since 2011. Apparently this injury happened in 2014 when he was like I think he was like assistant director of baseball operations for like the minor leagues. Like there's just no way that he didn't know everything about this injury to their like top prospect. Like there's no, there's no possible way. So how could this possibly come up at the very last second, unless this was just cold feet? That's the only thing that makes sense. You might be right on. It's, it's different. It's guesswork at this point. Yeah. We're, we're guessing. It's, spe- Look, it's a speculative and conjecture. Let me ask you this. Logan it's, Webb not, just, it's not an outlandish shot, uh, thought. Right? Thought? No, not at all. Not at all. I think he's onto something. Um, okay. We're getting some sub tweets. Let's role play for a second here. Wait, wait, wait. Let's not play anything. Let's not play anything. No, no, no. This is a Kevin Gosman tweet that oh, Logan Webb retweeted and then said, can I get an amen? There's Go a ahead, fine line it. between dipping an Oreo for the perfect amount of time or having it break off into the milk. Sometimes in life, you got to just take risks and be able to live with the consequences. Logan Webb retweeted it and said, can I get an amen? So I think uh, <laughs> think Gazi and Webb. Oh, man. Well, that that was that was the other, other aspect of it. You kind of hit on <clears throat> the players and their reaction to this. I think that's there might be some fallout on that front. I mean, heck, what if Brandon Crawford, who has already relinquished shortstop to Carlos Correa, feels disrespected and you know he's from Pleasanton so he's probably going nowhere and he's a longtime giant and he's it means a lot to him but let's say he wasn't he could easily demand a trade and Farhan would look really really bad right now and and the the damage control would start to spiral let's talk about I'm a solution guy so let's talk about solutions for a second um you're Farhan you're take us into that office you've been in this job Ned you know it well take us behind the scenes what, what do you think he's doing right now? Is he looking at this second and third tier free agents saying, hey, you know what? I can't get a top tier guy. Maybe I'll get Andrelton Simmons, who's a defensive player, uh, and still move Crawford off a shortstop. And I'm, I may be even getting a better defensive player. I'm not getting the offensive player of Correa, but I'm not paying that freight and that price tag. Um are they? Is he looking at lower level guys? Do you think? Do you think you you now look at your minor leagues and start talking to your top minor league people and say, "Hey, look, if we decided we want to go real young this year, who give me the the rank and file of who we can actually expect to see in the majors this year among our players? <clears throat> are you are you looking for the bad? I I with them if I were them. I'd be looking at teams like Arizona with Bumgarner. The one thing the Giants have is they got a lot of money. They, one thing they don't have is they don't have a lot of prospects. So I'd go to teams like Arizona with Madison Bumgarner and say, hey, I'll take your $40 million that you still owe Bumgarner, but I want you know, Paven Smith or Jake McCarthy or I want a reasonable prospect trade on Cattell Marte. I'll take $40 million off your plate that you don't want to pay because I got the money and you don't. But I, but you got to give me some players, or I'll go to Detroit. Scott Harris, who's the former Farhan's former assistant, now the general manager of the Tigers. They signed Javi Lopez. It's a monster deal, or Javi Baez. It's a monster deal. Baez was disappointing this year. Do you go to a team like that and say, "Hey, I'll take Baez and his monster contract off your hands, and and that will make your your owner happy." But I want a good player or two to go along with it. Do you try to get creative? by using what you have, which is cash and trying to lure another team to attach a real player to a, a big contract that they're maybe would like to get out from underneath. How difficult is it to put deals like that together? You know, I, they're all, everything is, is, uh, is possible. Uh, nothing is easy. Um, I think the, the key thing is really evaluating where your team is at to really know what you're capable of and, and not, and not kidding yourself. And especially with your prospects, it's difficult to play in the big leagues. Anybody thinks that people are just going to walk right in and dominate, you know, like, like Madison did years ago, that that's not common. It's more common to have a player go up and back, struggle, you know, go through a tough time. You know, it's, it's, you know, I send Kershaw out, you know, because he wasn't quite ready yet. 
you're talking about, you know, a Hall of Fame guy, first ballot guy. So it's not that easy. So you, But you have to be honest with your evaluation, as does your player development people. They've got to tell you who is really capable of what. And that helps you focus in on what are we going to do? Are we going to go young? Are we going to start to pick up, you know, a, a few contracts? You know, that's certainly a viable option. But those teams that are saddled with those contracts, you know, do they have a farm system that has enough talent? Because if you're saddled with a contract that you're trying to move, you know, wh whoever it is, if, if that's where you're at, you know, you're kind of in worse shape than the team you're talking to because right. you can't do anything. So it, it all depends. It, it, I'm not trying to evade the answer. Every situation is different. A conversation with Scott Harris in Detroit is going to be different than Mike Hazen in Arizona. They're all going to be different conversations because everybody is in a slightly different situation. But, you know, you have to, the main thing you have to do is really evaluate where you're at. When are you going to beat the Dodgers? When are you going to beat San Diego? Those are the two teams in the division you're going to have to beat in order to win a division. Okay. They did it a couple of years ago. Are they capable of doing it again? They won 81 games. The team down south won 111. It's not going to be the same team going forward, but 111 and 81 is a pretty different. That's how many games is that? You know, so you're that far away. Where, where are you at? When are those players going to be able to compete? You've also got two other teams. We just talked about Arizona and you got Colorado that aren't just sitting around. You know, they're trying to do the same thing. So you've got to be able to truly, truly evaluate who you have at the big league level and the ETA of a minor league player and really the ceiling of a minor league player. And when is that ceiling going to be reached? You may have the top prospect in the sport. That doesn't mean they're winning the MVP and they're going to be unanimous rookie of the year in 23. doesn't mean that. So, it, it, you know, to answer the question in a, kind of a, a, a roundabout way. You got to evaluate where you're really at and how you, how you stack up against the teams that you have to beat. Because first and foremost, any team in the NL West is going to have to beat the Dodgers and beat San Diego. Who's capable of doing it and when? If you kid yourself, you got no shot. And yet you one time said to me, and probably more than one time, hey, we can't win 79 games. Now that was the final decade of candlestick and you guys were trying to establish momentum on the field and off the field to get pack bell park built and so that was a, a lot of it right that that you really didn't want to and also you kind of knew your market you guys were very keenly aware that you know that uh, you were going to have to have to have to get any kind of attendance in this bay area you were going to have to have a competitive product on a consistent basis um, do you think the thinking is the same now that, I mean, it, it's like that organization that you worked for is in some ways exactly the same as the organization now, but in many ways, they, those, the days that you guys were there, those were far more frugal days than oh, this well, team. Well. This team now has revenue. It's not 500 million annually, like the Dodgers enjoy, but the Giants are, are I think, fifth in total revenue in the entire sport. They were 13th in payroll. Um, I always ask, well, why weren't they top five in payroll if they were top five in revenue? Uh, I think that's actually a problem as well. But, um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a tough, it's a tough thing to sit there and say, where are you? Because also it's a matter of where how what would be the reaction in your market if you did bottom out like the cubbies have bottomed out the astros have bottomed out they've done it in relatively big markets and gotten away with it the giants always seem to feel like they can't do that here are they right they're probably right although one of the main differences from when i began there to today is the value of the franchise right the, the franchise has skyrocketed billions as, as they all have and, you know, I think that Bob Lurie sold the franchise for maybe 110, 115 million. And, and that was, you know, to, to Peter and Larry's credit, you know, and Harmon Burns. I mean, they went everywhere looking for investors to try and keep it going and keep it in the city, which they were able to do. So it was totally different. And 
that is a major change. And I'm sure Scott Forrest brought that up as he was talking to them about any player he represents. Because I heard it a nauseum year after year after year. Yeah, you may be only making this much money this year, but your franchise value continues to go up. It's like owning a house, right? Except maybe today in this market, but for the last right. 30 years, all they do is go up. So that is a drastic change from, from our early days at, at Canada. And, and even like I said earlier in the show, the 0-2 team, go to the seventh game of the World Series. Guy that won the MVP in 2000, he goes to, to Houston, Jeff Kent, Russell Ortiz, we have to trade to Atlanta. So, and that you know, was because you guys totally got some tighter parameters financially. That from O two mm-hmm. to O three, the owners said, "Hey, let's uh, let's rein it in. Instead of spending more, they spent less." Well, yeah, we spent less, or we spent about the same. I can't remember exactly what the deal yeah. was. All I know is that you know we we lost some pretty key guys, and you know, and that that was you know that was then you know. But you you have to you have to be like I said, you have to be honest with where your franchise is at. And it's tough to be in San Francisco and win 70, 75 games, 79 games, to win 81 games. You know, people, you know, it's not, no no stadium has a uh, a cheap ticket price necessarily. You know, people pay to go to these events. They want to be entertained. And in in the cities that I've worked in, uh, even in Chicago, I worked in the team I grew up watching. You know, if we didn't, if, the Cubs didn't play well. They weren't coming to Wrigley Field. A little bit better today, maybe. But that wasn't that way. In San Francisco, when I first got there, we were losing 90-some games a year. My first year with them was 95, and my second year, 96, obviously. I think we lost 90-plus both seasons and had a tough time drawing. And then 97, suddenly, the new ballpark came online a little bit. But we still had to make sure that we were competitive, and we did it. And that was the first year. Brian took over as a GM and I moved up to assistant GM. And from that point on for, you know, the rest of my tenure. And then after I left, uh, you know, three world series, you know, they, they did everything they needed to do at, at every level, including ownership. If Farhan called me and said, what do you think we should do? I think I would, I would bring up your 1997 team, Ned, because you guys went in the free agent market uh, you signed Daryl Ham- Hamilton, the late Daryl Hamilton. You signed, I think it was Mark Lewis, maybe Russ Davis. There was, uh, um, I was JT. I think JT Snow came over that year. That was the Matt Williams trade year, yeah. and and you guys went for a bunch of guys in their prime. And I remember Brian saying it that that off season, hey, you know, we want to get more guys in their prime. Um, and you made a, made a lot of improvements to a club that didn't look very good at the end of the '96 season. And but you didn't do it with superstars. You did it though with solid middle of the road major league veterans, the caliber of which many there's still many players like that on the free agent market today. You know you can get Will Myers or Andrelton Simmons. They're not perfect players, but you're not paying a king's ransom. I think that's probably the route I would go if I was Farhan. Is try you know I think there's too many teams in the big leagues that I think you got to have guys in your prime. So you get too many guys past their prime, not good. You get too many guys ahead of their prime, not good. But if you can get guys in that, whatever it is, 26 to 32 range, um, that's that's maybe a ball player's prime. And, and there's guys out there that they could probably plug in. Um and and see if you can if you can do that. I mean, I I thought that was a very effective off season that you guys had. You changed the dynamic. They weren't superstar guys, but they were solid major leaguers. And then suddenly in '97 there was depth, and then that led into the white flag trade with the White Sox in the middle of the '97 season. And you guys kind of rode that to the playoffs, and then success at the end of the decade and into 2000, the beginning of the ballpark. Um, well, I mean, here's. What did you think of that offseason? And it seemed like that was your guys' strategy going into that that 97 year, and it really worked. I'll tell you what we did. We found players, and we did our homework. And we knew, without watching them in your clubhouse every day, we knew the attitude that they brought. Jeff Kent. The guys in the room. Jeff Kent. J.T. Snow. Daryl Hamilton. You've mentioned, you know, you've already mentioned these guys. These guys had a chip on their shoulder. They wanted to play. 
they wanted to win. J.T. Snow, two years earlier, had had a big year for Anaheim, and then he had tailed off in, in 96, okay? And, and, and Brian knew him from the Yankee days because he was drafted by him. And so we got guys that would play. We got guys who would, would just grind it out, who hated to get beat, and who had something to prove. Those are key guys. You know, Rich Aurelia later on, same type of guy. You know, it was a minor league player when we got him, but we knew that this kid had fire to him and he was going to compete. And that's what you have to do. But, and that's a, that's a way of doing it. And if you look at the Cubs and you brought the Cubs up earlier, you know, when, when Theo first got there, Theo would sign guys to one-year deals or maybe a two-year deal and then flip them at the trading deadline oh. for a prospect or two over and over again. So we got Jake Arrieta, I think. And so that was yeah. that. Oh, I that remember that was. one. Yeah. Victor but first, Victor Zambrano, back, I think. To go back to the 97 Giants, you guys can look up when those deals were made. We're way past that time on the calendar right now. Yeah. We're way past that. Matt Williams was traded during the GM meetings, maybe a month ago on the calendar. Okay. JT Snow was in and around the same period of time, I think. You know, Ryan, you know, could look it up. When were these, when we, when did we trade for Jeff? When did we trade for JT? Daryl Hamilton, I think we signed a little bit later. We waited for the market to, to develop for him and crater a little bit and, and, and made a smart deal for him because we needed a leadoff man. We needed a center fielder. But these deals were not, you know, they weren't done after the first of the year. And, you know, it's, it's tough to make deals as it is. But we, we knew who we were getting. And we knew that they hadn't achieved their full potential and may never have done it. Okay. But we also knew that they had compete to them. They had massive compete. We didn't look at a lot of analytics and a lot of stats and things like that, but we knew who these guys were. I had talked to Dallas Green, my first boss on the eve of acquiring Jeff Kent. And I knew, you know, again, you scout everybody. I had worked for Dallas. I knew his, his threshold for a player who would not compete. He didn't have a threshold for a player who didn't compete. And when I called him the night before we, we agreed to do that deal, I said, tell me about Jeff Kent. You managed him. And he says, if you're looking for a guy to, to, to hold parties and to be a, a, a great spokesman and to, to yeah. hang out with everybody, you got the wrong guy. You want a guy that's going to come out every day and play like it's the last day of his career. That's him. He will battle everybody for everything. I don't need more than that. Okay. Another guy, Billy Miller coming up through the system was another guy who played every day. Like it was his last. These are key guys. And, and that's a way to do it. Cause I think, as I said, the, and somebody could look this up, the 95 and 96 teams were losing in the nineties. Yeah. And so I, I've got the trades here. I, I remember, by the way, I saw you guys at Wrigley field before Rod jumps in at the end of 96. I was in Chicago that, that, that August or that September. And you guys came in for a series. And I can remember that team. It had, it had Kim Batiste. It had, there was Richie, but there was Kim Batiste and there was Rick Wilkins. And there was, you got, it's a lot of those guys who were like borderline major leaguers or, yes. or, you know, maybe minor league ball players. And we were calling guys up for the instructional league. Yeah. I mean, it was, a, it was a, and Barry had been hurt that year. Right. I think Barry had the injury that, and then he came that's back. That's how we did it to answer your question. And you know yeah. what? And I, I replicated it in LA. The team I inherited lost 91 games. In 05. That's the team I inherited. Okay. Second worst team since the end of the Second World War in that franchise's history. And the next year we won 88. And you know how I did it? I did it the same way. Nomar Garcia Parra, one year deal. Billy Miller, short term deal. Kenny Lofton, one year deal. All these guys competed. I knew it. I, I knew I knew two of those three. Rafael Fercal was 26, 27 years old, free agent. Leadoff man, centerpiece, play in the middle of the field. That's what we always went after. And that was really, if you if you looked, if people really studied the Giants through Brian's tremendous Hall of Fame career or and the Dodgers during during my tenure, I mean there, there were guys that competed. And and that's what you gotta have. If you look at which team, the Dodgers and the Giants from about 97 all the way through to today. In the last, how many years is that? That's 25 years. How many times has one of those teams been in the postseason? A lot. I bet it's close to 20 out of 25. 
of yeah. those two teams. And how many times did they go to the LCS? Maybe 10. That's not easy to do. But the but the the foundation of those clubs were guys who would compete, who didn't care. You know, they would just they 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 were fierce in their approach. And that's what we lived on. And that's what they did. A couple chats here. Sons of Johnny O'Master donate four ninety nine. Complete organizational failure. This will become a case study on how not to conduct free agent signings. The front office and the ownership alienated the free agents and the fans at the exact same time. Um, and the players. I, I would say, you know, how much did managing uh, expectations? I mean, I, you and I talked many times through the years, but I, you know, it was always like. Hey, I just did this, not hey, Lair, I'm hoping to do this. And, you know, oh, I can't wait. Oh, I didn't do it. I don't remember you ever disappointing us because it was always like you didn't really tell us about it until it was in the 11th hour and you'd done the deal and it was coming down. Um, it's too unpredictable. Managing expectations. I mean, that's a big part of the job. It, it's like a lot, it's it's no different than sales. Danny does it when he, with his own clients. You got to manage the expectations of your fans, of the ownership group. Um, I mean, how, that's a big part of the gig, isn't it? No doubt. And that's why we yeah, we didn't need to tell anybody what we were gonna do. We just told them what we did do. Frisco yeah. Willie says, here's $4.99. How can people think this is on Farhan? Clearly the top owners killed this deal. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know who can, who did this. I mean, this could have been Farhan getting cold feet. This could have been an owner pushing for it last week and backtracking. But it does seem like there probably was some shift in the in the thinking. like Because they wouldn't have gotten this far with Boris and this far with Correa if they didn't, if they didn't have a real excitement about the player and they wouldn't have gotten to where they're at now, where he's a New York Met, if there wasn't something dramatic that made them shift that excitement, it, it, you know, I know we, we don't know the answer. We don't know if it's, is it, it could be all Farhan's fault. He could have said something wrong. It could be all the owner's fault to push Farhan to go after this player and then got cold feet when they looked at the deal and the reaction to it in the, in the week after what's your, what's your read on that? It's it's all possible. I mean, we're yeah. you know we may never know, you know, but it's it, it's all possible. You don't look. It's 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 not easy to get out of a deal because of a physical, but it's not hard. It's not easy to put every player on the IL, but it's not hard because guys are always banged up. There's no player that is you know completely injury free their whole career, so. You want to bang a deal, you get cold feet, or you change your mind, or something does show up that you're not comfortable with, or to your point earlier, you can't get insured. You know, I mean, that's a lot of that's a lot of iron to be taken on if you can't insure a portion of it. But yeah. to call well, a press that's conference, feet. that's actually if that's what goes on, that's actually a good business decision. You know, it's, so. it, it's just unbelievable they called the press conference, though. Yeah, I mean, that's, 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 that's the thing. I mean, they had all week. They announced it last Wednesday or, or whoever it, it got announced. And yet the Giants had, according to what I read today about Boros, he gave the Giants a timeline to get it done because, you know, it's not a done deal, as you know. So the Giants had this time. Until 1 p.m., I agree. But, I mean, he told them when they made the agreement, okay, you know, Got a whatever how many days to get the thing signed. Uh, the fact that they waited till the t really the twelfth hour almost like I mean eleven fifty nine and the and they cancel a press conference. How does that is that a mis, is that a communications error or is that just inexperience? How does that happen, Ned? I I don't know because I I that's that's the piece to me that I can't. I can't explain. <laughs> you know, I can explain not being comfortable with a physical. I can explain yeah. the insurance. I can understand all of that. You know, uh, scheduling a press conference, having a, the player in town, and then kind of you know ghosting the, the other side. It's like, huh? You know, I I, I don't. Have know. you ever I, had I, buyer's remorse, Ned? Ever? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You've had buyer's yeah. remorse. Oh yeah, Andrew Jones. Have you ever had an owner have buyer's remorse? 
to oh, you I'm like sure. or like I'm after sure. a good Ned, man. I we got this guy, man. I wish we didn't do that. Well, see, I mean it's it's interesting that you would say that the reaction was, I guess, somewhat mixed. People were excited, but then it, it didn't reflect in in sales or, or I really believe that it didn't people. reflect in sales. Yeah. Huh? But now, but now you don't even, it, I, that's the thing I don't understand about the sales part of it is like, well, okay, if they started to win, people would come, but now you actually are going to legitimately have Giants fans that will not go out of spite, that will not spend any money at the ballpark. I mean, I was like all over this Giants Reddit community, which is probably the most positive Giants thing you will ever see. And everyone is like, this is it, man. Like I, I've, I've given this whole uh, the front office, the ownership, I've given them the benefit of the doubt, you know, four or five times in a row. And it's like every time they just, you know, they, it's a uh, Charlie Brown kicking the football and, and it's just how many more times can you take it? And I think personally, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the giants don't win another world series for another 50 years or 40 years or however long it takes to move into a new ownership hand, because it seems like the ownership it seems like two, not enough. There's no, not one person that like has power and there's no delegation to Farhan. It seems like there are all these different people are on different pages. And it seems like to me, which I can kind of understand, they won their three world series. You know, they're beloved here. They're making all this money. They just kind of probably want to chill, compete just enough to, you know, be around 500, give the fans some hope that maybe if they land a star, they could make the playoffs, make the playoffs one out of every four or five years. Like I'm talking like New York Knicks, like this Carlos Correa move sound like felt very, uh, oh man, we thought we were getting Kyrie and KD and instead we got Jalen Brunson, you know, but except for they backed out of the Brunson deal. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's not really a question, but yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, you know, go, uh, go ahead, Ned. I don't want to interrupt you. Well, no, I, 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 you know, it, I get it, Ryan, you know, yeah. and, you know, the fans is what fuels the sport. So whether it's individually in a city or whether it's overall. Um, Will Martinez is just four ninety nine. This never happened or would have happened under Sabian. Uh, Dodgers and Padres are spending big and are using analytics while the Giants are using analytics with no vision. I, I don't, I, you know, I don't really, I couldn't really comment on that. Mike Vass says, I want to thank Mr. Coletti for his insights and great knowledge. We do thank Ned for, thank you. for joining thank us you, and giving us uh, a lot of his experience. We got this one from Romo 2001. He says the twins who had Carlos Correa all of 2022 offered him $280 million and on a 10 year term, a team like the twins don't offer contracts that big often obviously they would have known his health status. I found that interesting as well. I think that's a great point by Romo. Uh, I'm, I, I know this is something that you always took note of. Um, did the team that had the player that you're going after want to retain that player? And if they didn't, why? And that's almost like a, an answer you need to get to the bottom of. In this case, the Twins uh, you know, mm -hmm. offered 10 years and 280. So they, they were privy to his medicals. So on some level, they had to be okay with the player – that they know better than you know them, right? They just had them this year. I, I think that's an interesting observation by Romo. What do you think? That is a very, I mean, if it's factual, again, uh, uh, we know it. 10 and 280 was what was yeah, offered. Don't, Minnesota is not reported. known to do that. Um, that's unusual for that franchise. Certainly not the financial wherewithal of, uh, of, of the teams on the West Coast we've been talking about. Um but nobody knows a player better than the team he was just with. That's, and you learn a lot. I, or I should say I learned a lot by how, how teams, what teams thought who just had the player, whether they wanted the player or not, you know, because they, <laughs> they know the player. And not just in this case, in any case, nobody knows a player better than a team that just had the player. The habits, Matt Wright. the health. The compete, yeah. the sacrifice, the selfishness, and you know, in some cases, yeah, the good, the bad. Oh, yeah. Matt Wright Nobody says, "Here's nine ninety nine. He says, "After Susan Slusser broke the Scott Boris comments as to what happened, can you believe the weak statement Farhan issued in response? It was absolutely pathetic, embarrassing, fireable. I won't have you comment on that because I think that's that crosses a line a little bit. But I do." I did find it interesting, and I would have, I would really want to ask you about this when we talked earlier today. It came out that 
that um, he went to the Mets, obviously. The Giants did not get ahead of this. They let Boris take the lead on this. Boris released a statement. The Giants, to this point, have not released much of a statement at all other than just kind of a statement of fact. Like, we were engaged with the player. We are no longer engaged with the player. You know, so on and so forth. Just very, very low, low in details. They kind of allowed Scott to kind of, you know, take control of this thing PR wise. Do you see this as a P I mean, you, you, your beginnings in baseball for people who don't know Ned Coletti started in baseball on the PR side of things in the Chicago Cubs organization. So you have a PR background. Are, is this, are the giants in a worse situation? Do you think um, on the field or is this a bigger mess PR wise in your mind? Well, I mean, we know a, they're not as good as the Dodgers and Padres. We pointed yeah. that out, but they still are an iconic franchise. They still have some prospects. They still have, you know, uh, you know, some some talent on their major league roster. Is is this? And I personally don't didn't like the thirteen year deal anyway on this player. I just think they look bad, and I think they bat- botched it and handled it poorly. But do you think their biggest issue is PR, or is their biggest issue? baseball players and talent and and where they're at in the off season compared to what's available well i think they're connected i think if I, right, right now obviously it's it's a, it's a bit of a pr firestorm okay the team wins they go back to playing like they did 2 years ago this is all history korea you know breaks down in spring training with a, a reoccurring injury you know, it, it all goes away too. You know, it's, it's just a difficult spot to be in when you've alluded to big things you're going to do. Didn't do them. Had this leak out some way, shape or form, the, the, the signing of this player, good or bad, overpriced or not. You know, obviously he is a good player. You forget about the money and you just say, well, that's a pretty good ad. You know, you can, I, I could never do that, but some people just say, I don't care what they spend as long as they get better. But then, you, you know, you lose that option. And so it's, it's suddenly now it, it, is a, it is a PR thing. You know, I go back to what I said at the outset. You know, when do you call a press conference? When you have something to announce. Not, not when you have nothing to announce. So that to me is, is the most, you know, I don't know, interesting, quizzical you know, unknown of the whole deal. Like I said at the beginning of this show, I can understand not being satisfied with a physical. I can understand uh, having an insurance issue. If that's the case that you can't get insured, you know, you enter into this 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 type of deal. Uh, if if your insurance is something you do, and not every team does it, okay, uh, that that's part of your thought process. That's part of the deal you need to make in order to make the deal. I get all of that and that's, and that's business. And that's, that's smart business. It's, you if, know, it's the press conversation that I go, well, you know, well <laughs> right. It, it, that, that, one's the, that one's an odd one. Um, if, if your phone rang and you were suddenly in this job, what would you say? And, and I mean, I think it's really important and I feel like you and Brian did a great job, I'm not, both here in San Francisco. I think you did a great job of this in L.A. In in just talking enough to the fan base, right? You're not talking, you're not lighting fires and trying to get people all excited, but you're ta- you're keeping a dialogue going through the media with certain select people, and you're having that dialogue with your fan base. If you if you if the Giants put put this job in your hands right now and said, Ned, this is a huge, huge firestorm. People are upset. And you had to sit, let's say, on a KMBR or a 95-7 The Game or and, and actually speak to the fan base about this situation and what you want to do going forward. What would you say? What would you – if you actually were given this job, you're the new GM of the Giants, and you've got to kind of – first kind of verbalize something to the fan base to acknowledge what's happened and that there's a new sheriff in town and this, there's a new direction and kind of reassure them. So I'm not sure I use that term. Well, 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? But there's a new leadership, a new way of thinking, and you're trying to kind of sell them on being patient and having your having trust in you, faith in you. What would you say to the fan base to try knowing what they've endured here this off season? They've been teased tremendously, and now they're they're you know they're they're looking really the team is looking really bad um, by the way things have gone. What, how, what would you verbalize to the fan base? Because I always felt like, to be honest, and I've never said this to you, I always felt like that was really an underrated aspect of your guys' success in San Francisco is Brian wanted to scout and wanted to be a baseball guy, but I don't think he wanted to have a dialogue with the media. I think he relied on you to have that dialogue and to bring the fan base along, and it worked. It really did work. What would you want to say to the fan base now to reassure them and to kind of set this new path? Well, uh, you've asked me a very difficult question because it's not something I had, you know, I'm thinking about or, I, I, you know, I would right. want to handle at this point. The um, Anybody, and I'll take myself out of it, you know, I think you have to explain the best you can as to what just transpired within the legalities of what you're allowed to speak about and, and explain your, explain your position. Uh, and also what you're, what you're hoping to do. You know, we, we, we need, you know, I'm not saying this is what the giants need, but you know, we, we need to, we need to compete. We need to find players that can compete. It may not be this off season. I don't know when it'll be, but that's what we're looking for. And we're looking for what we did in 97. We're looking for that, and and you know that's that's how we intend to turn it around. And we're going to draft, and we're going to develop players who compete, who have talent, and who have a fierceness to to their their appetite to be not just big league players, but to be championship big league players, and to understand understand what that's all about. They can't figure that out if that's not one of their goals, and they're in the organization. We'll have to figure out how to get them someplace else. And but as, as we go forward, those who want to compete and those who want to win a championship and the fierceness that it takes to do that, you know, that, that's what we're looking for. And you explain that. I mean, that's not, you know, that would, would you have done it today. To would you have spoken today? Oh, gosh, Larry, I don't know. I mean, this is a lot of hyperbole. Well, here. No, I, no, I, no, I mean, I mean, do you think it, like after something like this, this is dramatic. I mean, you've been in the game. This doesn't happen very often. The, this is not like an everyday thing or even an every year thing. Do you think that what happened today, if you were leading this team that you would want to speak today to them and say, Hey, you know what? I know there's like a lot of disappointed people here and I get that. Um, or would you just, would you not want to speak today? Do you think it's smart to let it die down and just don't speak, but just act and then let your actions. I think you, I you. think you have to speak. You have to speak. But I think you cannot speak until you know enough to speak. Gotcha. You got to know. You got to. You got to have some background. You got to. You got to have some. Data. You got to know what you're talking about. Right. It's like my free agent endeavors. You know, I would. My goal was I would do enough research and preparation that when I went to see Frank McCourt or Stan Caston. That I that there was no question they could ask me that I couldn't answer. If I had to say, ah, let me get back to you on that, I failed. So I would look at it the same way, no matter what it was. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna run an organization anywhere, and I'm gonna be the person that people are looking to for leadership and for direction and for vision and all of that, I owe I owe people a piece of my vision and, and things like that. But I need to know exactly where I'm at in order to do that. Those who speak quickly and those who speak without full information rarely speak well. Ned, That's I got tough. a question for Go you. Go ahead, Danny. We only got a couple more minutes yeah. with Ned. I'd like to try to get him out of here before Ned, no more than 10 minutes. I, I would say 10 yeah, more fine. minutes and then we'll call yeah. it a night for you. Yeah. Okay. When you were in the game as a GM, were there teams that were known as maybe they really weren't players, but in in chasing play after free agents, but oh, no they doubt. would talk or no doubt. was they were okay. all had no cattle group, but yeah. but they but they were, but would 
was there teams that, you know, they said, oh, they're not serious, even though they're going after this guy? Would would they do it just for the fan base to make it look like they were? To some, probably. Some, probably. But Interesting. Because I have this. You knew who, you know, from our perspective, we knew who would be players and who wouldn't. And who would, you know, Interesting. like to get everybody fired up when it didn't, you know, when they couldn't prove it or they couldn't fulfill it. There's always been, you know, those groups in the game, whether it's in the free agent market or whether it's in the trade market. Okay. And you kind of know who they are. There may have been one player a year or two players a year that we would go, wow, that came out of nowhere. But you always kind of knew, you know, you always kind of knew that, okay, you know, they're talking a big game. They don't have the payroll to do it. They don't have the appetite to do it. It's not their style. It's not how they do business. You know, and you, you check it all out. I mean, again, you scout everybody, you scout every situation as best you can. You got to know who your competition is. You have to know how agents think. You have to know how players think. You know, it was important for me whenever I talked to a player about coming to L.A. that they realized if they had a family, where they were going to have to live if the, if the family was coming to the game. You, you couldn't be living, you know, in Orange County or you couldn't be living in, you know, deep in the South Bay and get to Dodger Stadium without sitting in traffic for two and a half hours or coming from the far west side or Malibu or something. You know, I I, I had to be able to, to scout them enough to know, you know, this guy doesn't have the appetite for this. He may want to be here and he may want the Dodgers and all of that. But, you know, the way he's constituted and his his, his family, you know, he, he ain't going to be you know, having the, the wife get in the car for, for three hours with the kids back and forth for, you know, four or five hours. No, that ain't happening. You got to know, you got to know the entire deal. The The reason I asked that question, and I don't expect you to answer this, but this is my theory. The giants said they, no, no player was out of their realm of financially. And they made it clear that they were going to go after big name players. Well, they went after judge and they figured they're probably not going to get him, but, Hey, if we do get him, at least he sells tickets and we can do it. So judge, they don't get him. Well, let's go get Correa now and show the fans that we're serious about, you know, spending big money. They, they announced the deals announced, Hey, we even announced a press conference. And yet at the last minute, we have a good reason to pull out We're you know, it's, there's a health issue. But no other team seems to have the health issue with Correa. So in my mind, it looks like they just kind of were disingenuous to the fans. And they came up with nothing, even though they said they were going to. And it looks like they did come through. They almost got judged and they did get Correa, but they had to walk out, back out. Well, look, there's there's some things we just don't know. Yeah. And these are negotiations are not easy and they have many twists and turns to them. And, you know, I know enough to tell you, I don't know what happened. And you know, I just don't know. I can tell you that. Yeah. A little bit peculiar, a little bit unusual, but I don't know idea what happened. And, you know, to speculate on it, probably, you know, not the fairest thing to do, but do you, know, you uh... I think that, I think the intent I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, but I don't think the intent was to mislead at any point in time. I know Farhan a little bit. I don't think it's his intent. I know Larry very well. I know a lot of the owners. So, you know, I don't think it was their intent to mislead and, and have this, this feeling permeate the, the region. I don't think that anybody said, hey, let, let's do this. This will be a really good plan for us. I don't think anybody said that. I don't think anybody intended to do that. I think that sometimes information gets out prematurely. Sometimes you, 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 you set the course and sometimes you may be too open about your course, knowing that you have only control over one half of it. You have control over two halves of it or or know you can get the other side to to, to do what you wanted to do, you know, so something you know, that, that may have been, you know, a, a, a mistake at, at that point, but I don't think the organization, the way it's constituted and the people that run it thought that, Hey, this will be a good idea. We'll act like we're going to get involved. 
We'll even make a big time offer. And we know it'll get leaked by the other side or by a player or by whoever. And then, you know, we'll just, we'll wait a week or so. And then we'll just kind of ghost out of it. You know, I, <laughs> yeah, it's just so hard to trust though. No doing that. It's that's so hard to trust can... somebody because this injury stuff, whatever was out there is been known for years. I mean, the ankle injury happened in 14, the back injury happened in 18 or 19 and he's played three years and played almost three full seasons the last three years. So it just makes no sense to go after a guy and then all of a sudden just last second. Well, but you know what though? I mean, Larry, the, the best point I think I've heard in the last hour and a half was Larry's at the outset about the insurance. Yeah. Maybe because that's it. It's, it is tough to do. A but deal when would that come up, to, Ned? When this, isn't that, no isn't that rare that it would come up in the 11th hour like that? Well, I would think that so if the players do contract. Business, however they do it. I, I don't know. You know, you don't have an insurance company on hold. And who does that? Is that is that you, the general manager, does that? Or is that the owner? Or is there well, it's, who it's checks on somebody the else, maybe legal yeah. or somebody like that, who or HR? Probably when legal, would you do that? Would you do that? Company and, and when in the, in the going to deal with it at the end anyway? I mean, again, we don't know. But, you know, I mean, that that would be a concern of mine. If our intent was, OK, we're going to go longer than we want and we're going to pay more than we want. But we need to do this for all the reasons this group, you know, you three guys have stated. But you know what? We're going to have to get this insured and be sure we can do that. Well, that takes time. You're not going to do that in, until you know what you're going to do. You can't say, well, we may do 13 years. We may do 350. No, you're going to have to know what they're trying, what they're going to insure. And then, you know, how, how fast do they get back? Who knows the answer to that? That's a whole nother entity you're depending on. I mean, that to me was maybe the best the best answer I've heard or the best speculative approach I've heard today was, was Larry's on that. There's, yeah, what, a, there's uh, a question on there I would, I would like to get to from Nick. Yeah. There. Can I do that? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Just um, before Ned goes, can you please ask him his view on the state of the game now that teams are built on paper rather than with baseball people's eyes? Thank you, Ned. I'd rather not be working in the game if it was just built on paper. If, uh, if my career was built on paper, my, my grade point average in high school or, you know, where I went to college and all of that stuff, you guys wouldn't even know me. I wouldn't be anywhere near the sport. I wouldn't be <laughs> qualified enough to be in it if my career was based on paper. I need to know who the people are, who the players are, who's inside the uniform. You know, Justin Turner just signed with, with the Red Sox. This guy, you know, he was non-tendered at in his late 20s, ended up being a historic player, not because of paper, but because of who he is. I'd have to know who people are. Was I perfect at it? No. And sometimes you, you know it, the, you have the buyer's remorse when you're saying yes, because you know it doesn't fit. But you also know this is the big leagues. You, you can't play with AAA guys in a major market. You have no chance. So you hope that your culture is strong enough to turn somebody who doesn't necessarily fit and is not necessarily the type of player you would want, but you're kind of in a spot that you have to do it. Never good to negotiate with emotion, never good to negotiate out of desperation. Sometimes you have no choice, but I made a point of knowing who I had and knowing who they were, because when you get down to the end, when you get down to the second half of September or you're playing in the month of October, there ain't no piece of paper that's going to tell you how it's going to go. It's not. You got to figure out who can compete one on one in the heat of the battle, in the heat of the moment, and who is going to win those battles. It's it's it. That's it for me. Doesn't mean I'm right. Doesn't mean I'm wrong. Nick asked me a, an opinion. I guess my opinion, Nick. Yeah. No, and we appreciate it. Flav says here's nine ninety nine. Didn't understand the plan for Marco Luciano if this deal did happen. Uh, they signed him five years ago at 16 years old, thought he was our shortstop of the future. Does failed uh, Correa signing still tell us what the Giants think of him? From what I've heard, he's had some back problems. He's They believe he may outgrow shortstop, may outgrow third base, might wind up as a left fielder or even a DH, and um, is probably two full seasons away from the big leagues. So 
you know, that's the evolution of the prospect. And of course, if you move, he's got a tremendous bat, but if you move that bat from short to third, it's worth less. If you move it from third to left, it's worth less. If he's a DH, it's worth less. He's going to have to really hit. I think that's kind of his, from what I've heard, talking to Kyle Haynes and some of the Giants minor league people, um, they love the bat. They're not sure about the glove. They don't think it projects at shortstop. They don't, they're not sure if it projects in the infield. So that could change the dynamic on him. This is an interesting comment from CAA Mafia. He says, Otani Shohei <laughs> will be in the Mets rotation next year. All right. I want to ask you about Shohei. You're in Southern California. You've seen a lot of Shohei. Obviously, Shohei is kind of a better version of Aaron Judge, right? He's the, he's the ultimate draw. He, he will put people in the seats. They will come to see him. Um, he's got one more year on, on his deal, Ned. If, and there's a lot of talk. There's people that are suggesting Danny threw it out on their show the other day. He thinks the Giants ought to try to get him signed to like a $500 million deal and record setting and go get him and make him kind of the foundation piece of their rebuild, so on and so forth. What do you also think said of, you got to trade for him because I don't think they'll win a free agent battle. What do you think of <laughs> Shohei as a foundation piece for an organization like the Giants? What do you think of him long term? Is he a pitcher? And will stop hitting? Is he a pit? Is he a hitter who's going to eventually stop pitching? Is he a better as a closer? Is he better as a starter? Do you, and then would you go after him, right, as Danny suggested, in a trade either right now or in July, and try and just maybe trade prospects and hope gamble that you could re-sign the guy at the end of the year, um, or would you wait until the free agent market and say, you know what, I'm not going to trade a bunch of prospects for a guy who could walk at the end of the year, I'm just bidding on him in free agency. Give me your thoughts on the Shohei Otani card from the Giants' perspective, because he has been discussed thoroughly and obviously for all of the, the reasons that you would assume he's very intriguing. Well, if you're going to, the only way you're going to get him from Anaheim is to give them a deal they cannot hang the phone up on. And I mean, you have to be loaded with good, not just prospects, but guys that everybody knows are going to be big league players and contributors. Once you've done that and you, you have a team that's a 500 team, who else are you going to have? How else are you going to do this? And once you make a deal like that, think about the agent and think about the player. This team just gave up their farm system to get my client. And they want to sign my client. How desperate are they going to be to sign my client? That may be worth an extra five or 10 million a year. And you may not have the players to support the player at the end of the day. So you know, I think you know, if he stays healthy this year, I think the bidding on him will be historic in nature. I think that Aaron Judge did well and, and, and some of the other players we've talked about did well. Nobody will do as well as Mr. Otani. He's a unique talent. Have uh, you met him? If he were to do it for another, you know, four or five years as a pitcher and a, and a hitter, and then do it as a hitter after that, I mean, it's it's him and Babe Ruth, really. Nobody's been able to do it. Babe Ruth, Babe Ruth won almost a hundred games in the big leagues too. So he's a unique talent. There's no doubt. And your marketing and those other things, which I would never put ahead of the talent, you still got to win games, no matter what you think you're going to sell in jerseys and tickets, you know, I think that he'll be, he'll be massive. And I think the market um, that uh, he certainly got the Dodgers who I, I think would, I had an interest in him as a high school player, um, the Mets, the Yankees, you know, the way AJ Preller operates in San Diego, I wouldn't forget about them either. And they're you know, thinking that, big always, you know, they had, I think it'll be very interesting, but I, I I think trading for him is not necessarily unless you have both the farm system, not both, three things, <clears throat> the farm system to get it done, the big league club that's going to win right now, and a lot of dough that you're going to put into one player. Unless you have those three things, I can't see trading for him. It's because I mean, look at what what Soto commanded. Yeah, from uh, from Washington guy from San Diego. 
And they got Soto for, I think, what, the second half? They got second half of this year. In two more years, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Two years, yep. yeah. You're talking about months. In 10 months, this man's a free agent. So, oh, I would never trade for him unless – can you have a prearranged deal? Like if in a Teams team, aren't going to let you do that. Not they, let you? Okay. No. Do, that do you like him more as a hitter net or as a pitcher? You know, I was uh, – candidly, I am uh, I was wrong about him as a hitter. I thought that, that he could pitch, no doubt. I thought that his, his bat speed would, would not be able to – and if they busted him inside enough – that he wouldn't be quite the hitter he's become. I, I was wrong on that. He is he is a true drawing card and a ultra, ultra talented player. One of the most talented players I've seen. Uh, senior softball games, last couple ones here for Ned. Uh, get your questions in real quick. If you have one for Ned, we'll get him out of here. He says, get Ned's opinion on Gabe Kapler. Do you know Gabe Kapler? Uh, obviously had the incredible 2021 season. Other than that, he's been relatively a fi- he's been basically exactly a 500 manager in Philly and with the Giants outside of 2021. W- what's your what do you think of Kapler? Well, I, I think that how I would always evaluate somebody in that position is is how fundamentally sound the team is and how hard they play. We've all seen enough baseball. You know when a team is almost given up and almost trying to get the manager fired. Um, I certainly didn't see that two years ago. I saw a team that really played way above their, their talent level. And a lot of that credit goes to, to Gabe and his staff. Um, I didn't watch as many giant games this past year. So I, I, I don't know exactly uh, how it went. Uh, I go back to the 21 season. And when you win as many games as they won, and yeah, they, you know, they had a really good team. They didn't have a a team that in most years would win that many games. I think some of the teams Brian put together were better than those teams, but they never won the amount of games that Gabe's team did. So I think it depends on how hard the team plays for the manager and how well they execute. I think that's that's where the manager's value comes in. Two last ones on the chat that I think are real good. Uh, this is a good one, and I should have asked you this many times, and I never have asked you this question. Ned, what do you think about Jeff Kent's Hall of Fame candidacy? I'm um, I'm surprised that he hasn't been elected. Um, I'm too. He, um, I'm not sure what the reason is that he's not. He was a an outstanding, I mean, outstanding clutch hitter. People can say, well, he had Barry in the lineup. That doesn't make it easier. This man had 100 RBIs six or seven times. In another year, missed a bunch of games with an injury and almost had it again. And I think he holds the record for most home runs by a second baseman. And people say, well, he wasn't a great defensive player. No, he wasn't a great defensive player. But you know what? Strong arm. guys stood in to make a double play and played as hard as he did. I'm. Uh, I thought at this stage he'd be getting far closer, sixty percent of the vote, something like that, and, and be a borderline candidate at this point. Um, I tell you, what, I I don't know any player that competed harder than he did. He competed every day, and you know I had him in L.A. too at the end of his career. Yeah, and he was breaking down a little bit, but he he. Re- he just wanted to win, and um, you know, and he and he was productive. He changed the culture of that franchise again. Not like you know, a lot Barry. You know, wasn't the kind of guy like I said earlier with the Dallas Green comment. Wasn't going to take guys to dinner. Wasn't a rah rah guy. This and that. But you know what? When it, he showed up every day, he posted, and he tried to figure out a way to help his team win. He told me one time, I think I think I got the quote right, that his dad his dad taught him how to play. And said, "There's numerous ways to help your team win a baseball game. Figure out how to do that every day. And you know whether it's hitting the right side, getting a runner over, drawing a walk, working a pitch count to ten pitches to when a guy's starting to teeter a little bit to really make him work. All sorts of things. But yeah, I mean, a long answer to the question. I'm you know I'm I'm almost saddened that he hasn't had more respect." Uh, and more of a, a clamoring for um, for induction. 
Was he washing his truck or was he doing wheelies on a motorcycle? Um, <laughs> I think he came to a stoplight <laughs> on Hayden Road. I could take yeah, it to yeah. the spot and uh, the light turned green. I think he popped a wheelie and uh, ended up falling. But the story was he was washing his truck. What's yes. going on with the Dodgers before we let you go? What's going on with the Dodgers? Are they trying to – is free – can they let Turner go? They've let Bellinger go. Both are turners. they dipping Are they dipping beneath to reset the tax? Is that is that the – that seems like their game plan. They, they spend a ton. They dip beneath. It resets. It's very punitive if it doesn't reset, so it's kind of incumbent, even if you're loaded like they are as a franchise – financially to kind of dip below every three or four years. It seems like is that what we're seeing from Friedman this, this off season. Give me your interpretation so. what they're doing. Yeah. I, I think it, that that's, that's the goal. I think, you know, they also have something hanging over them that they don't know if it's going to cost them anything. And that's a Trevor Bauer suspension. Ah, yeah. Does that get cut in half? Does that get reduced? Are they on the hook for some of that? You know? Um, and I think, you know, they always, and it, it, it's so, shrewd and smart of them they always play the long game and i think as as they look and you know they everybody gets it we all get excited okay who's going to make the opening day roster right wow wow you know what that's good for that's good for one day right okay there's so many different things that are going to happen from april may june all the way through that you know they'll they do not want to not win they want to compete. The ownership group, I know very well, they are in it every year. I mean, to as as much as anybody I've ever been around, probably more than almost everybody I've ever been around. So that's not the issue. Dipping below the line and still competing and then maybe seeing where you're at as the season goes on and making that decision when you have to, not when, you know, not when you you know you need to do it ahead of time. There's, there's days, there's segments of a season that your decision-making becomes keener and you get to a crossroads. I think that's what they're probably doing. And they have the Trevor Bauer thing kind of hanging over them, not knowing if that's going to get reduced and, and what that'll mean to them. But make no mistake, they will compete and they will have a good team and they will continue to cause a lot of hassle, hassle in this division. My last question, and then I'll let Danny throw one and then we'll let you get on. Um, you know, Ross Stripling and I'm, sh and, and from your days in LA, give me your thoughts on Stripling, a and kid. Uh, I'm an a and fan, so I kind of like Ross Stripling, but then also they got Sean Maniah, they got Mitch Hanniger. We've got a lot of Giants fans, over 500 of them in this chat right now, looking down, um, and looking for your insights on these guys, Maniah Stripling, uh, and, and, uh, the, the outfielder, Mitch Hanniger. What do you think of those guys individually? I know you you know Stripling probably the best. Well, Anagra, a good player. I think he's bang, been banged up a little bit. Um, so you know, you've got a veteran player who knows how to play. Um, I, I saw Sean a lot against LA, and you know it. You know he was he was backing up a third a lot. You know it's so. Uh, you know maybe it's an unfair. You know, he had a rough year. Thing to do, but you know I mean he. You know, he's a contact guy, and there'll be a lot of contact. Ross is um, not overpowering. <laughs> there'll be a lot of contact. Okay. I think there'll be a lot of contact. All right. All right. Fair and, enough. Um, and, and Ross is um, uh, was one of the people who, as he was coming up in the organization, I refused to trade. And really? And I had other pitchers that I – that had maybe more velocity, you know, which is obviously to some people a big deal. And those were the, those were the pitchers I pushed to be acquired from other clubs as I was trying to win divisions. And um, I don't want to trade Ross. I had, I still have great appreciation for his ability to think when he participates you will never, ever doubt the effort of Ross Stripling. Is he going to blow you away at 98, 99? No. Is he going to pitch? Yes. He will pitch and he will compete. How it's going to go, I can't tell you. But I do know that, uh, as John Sherholtz told me years ago, the great Atlanta Brave 
executive, Hall of Fame executive, when I asked him when I got the job and he called to congratulate me and I said, give me a piece of wisdom. You know, and he said, I always ask myself, can I trust a player? You will never, ever not trust Ross Stripling to the nth degree. And he will pitch and he will try to figure it out pitch to pitch and watch bat speed and watch you know angles of hitters and anxiety of hitters and mix in off speed. But again, he's not going to blow you away. He's not going to win 18 games or 15 games and strike out an average of 10 a night. Not who he is. Didn't you trade with Sherholz? Wasn't it Wilson Betamite for, for Cal? No, maybe it was. Or... It was a trade that hurt both teams. <laughs> Glass half full, guys. Says here's four ninety nine. What would Ned do in the giant shoes? Go check the stream. We we already covered that one, and we got this one from Flav. He says nine ninety nine. Ned, I was dragged to a random Dodgers game years ago. I love the way you said. I was dragged. Ended up seeing you, and you were kind enough to take a picture with me. Thank you for being such a stand up guy and everything you've done for the Giants. So Flav, throwing Flav, some thank you, Bill. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I'm done. Danny, go ahead. I, Danny and Rye have one last one, I'm sure, for you. Ned, I just want to say thank you very much for, for joining us tonight. we got over 500 people in the in the stream. I think this has been riveting, really good informational stuff. You know, I, I, I never, you know, and, and you know me, I never wanted you to come on here and bash the ownership or bash Farhan. And I know you're too classy of a guy to do that. There's enough there's enough questions, you know, that have been brought up that that make the ownership look bad, that make Farhan look bad. They've got to figure things out for themselves. But I just want to preach. I just want to say I appreciate you coming on here and balancing. You know, these are tough topics and not necessarily all that favorable to people that you know and may like in some cases. So I just want to say thank you for doing it. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing with the fans and with us. Uh, and that being said. Uh, um, Let's flip it over to Ryan, Danny, for one last question, and then we'll get on with our night. Go ahead, go ahead Danny. Once you jump, or go ahead, Ryan. For me, who's ever? You know what? I'm 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 gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna pander a little bit to the audience, to the chat. Uh, so, Dan, why don't you go first? Audience, I'm giving my one question to you guys. Uh, some the best question <laughs> I see doesn't even have to be um, any money thrown down. Best question I see. I'll use that one for that. There you oh, go. Best question. Look, if you're in look, the chat, there's 502 people in the chat right suck now. Suck up. If you have the best, the best question you can come up with in the chat, or I will throw it. Now we'll go to Danny, who's um, he's got a hat, he's got a jersey, no stirrups, but he's almost in. Yeah, well. yeah. Go ahead, Dan. Se- season ticket holder, about to be X. Um, yeah, Ned, you're the GM. The Giants. Farm system is middle of the pack. Guys are still a year or two away from maybe making it up. Giants at the trade deadline are three, four games out of a wild card spot. Do you, knowing the roster they have, do you sell as many assets that you have on the 26-man roster and try and rebuild it? lower salary because nobody's going to be there anyway, probably. So are you going to lower the salary and try and rebuild or are you going to go for it and try and make a, make it into a wild card spot? Well, for me to answer that question, I'd have to really know the system. And I, it's, I it's know. not that great right now. Well, <laughs> it's, it's so, so you, you got- need the capital, you need the capital of talent. How are you going to get it? You're either going to sign it, develop it, and have it learn its way and go through the struggles of that. It takes time, but it's it's an efficient way, and you have a chance if you do it that way. You also have the free agent market or the trade market. You've got a number of ways to do it. And again, I'll go back to something I said, and that, that was a great comment that you know about the you know one more question ten you know forty five minutes ago. <laughs> and, exactly. You know, that was pretty good. You got to be able to figure out where you're at. And that's the most important thing. And you may be three or four games out at the deadline. Chicago White Sox were three games out in 1997 and traded us Wilson Alvarez, Roberto Hernandez, and Danny Darwin. Three pitchers. Who does that? Three games out. But they knew where they were. Ron Schuler knew where his team was, even though you know the fan base was erupted and you know, it wasn't a good moment for them, but they knew they weren't going to, they may get in, 
they may catch Cleveland, but they may be playing three more days and out. So and you have a chance to reload, you got to do it. I think I'd be real realistic with the farm system. And I would highlight two or three players that I thought had the talent and the compete and, and the approach to be great giants. I wouldn't let them go. I would continue to nurture them and continue to fine tune their game and challenge them along the way, put them in situations where they're going to struggle and see how they do with that. May mean moving them up an org, uh, a ladder, a, a level a few months early and see where they go. And I think I would try and sign players that if you're, if you're really an 81 and 81 team, and if that's the legit the giants, if that's who they really are, and your farm system is in the middle. Highlight the two or three guys that can really, really help you and really play and just continue to develop them and try and build the other guys up and use the other guys as, as sweeteners to get deals done. And I would sign a player or two that were going to be free agents at the end of the season because they're going to compete, and they may, if they're a pitcher, they may be 10-5 and five at the break, and boom, somebody's going to need pitching. Now you may be able to get another prospect that goes into that group of two or three. And maybe you do that two times, or maybe you do that three times. And so when you get to a year from now, you've got about five or six legitimate guys that you think are going to be able to compete and play for the San Francisco Giants at the highest level, to be the next Crawford, to be the next Bumgarner, the next Lincecum, the next Belt, the next Pablo, the next Posey, Hall of Famer, you know, all those types of things. And that's what you're going to have to do. There's no easy way to do this. This is not sports. Professional sports is not a snap of the finger or a wish and a hope. And things happen. The Let seasons your seed are come. <laughs> the seasons are too long. Yeah. You, it, it tests everything you've got. Yeah. If you don't have it, you got no sh- chance. Yeah. So Gilbert Gamboa says, "Here's ten bucks." He says, "Thank you, Ned." And then Joe Schmo notices all those. Baseball oh, things. Larry, don't stop. But that was uh, going to be the uh, one I was going to choose. Uh, okay, go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead. Go well, ahead, first, I wanted to I did want to give a shout out to this one because it made me laugh. Obviously, people are going to be like, hey, oh, uh, is this like is Farhan have to be fired now? Like all that kind of stuff that obviously I wouldn't want you to have to answer. I read this one, Lair, in uh, Will Gavin's voice in a British accent. I just thought this was a great way of phrasing. Uh, is this is this uh, is somebody going to get fired over this? Our jobs in jeopardy as a result of this nonsense. That's exactly what this is. It's nonsense. Okay. Um, so I, I have a double question. So the first one is favorite ball. And then somebody also asked favorite current ball player. And I was yeah. going to put a spin on that. Just a guy that you love to watch that like you, like you talk about that you think just competes and it kind of just fires you up. And favorite ball means of those ones in the yes. background. Ned. Be- behind you have you. a yes. favorite collectible behind there. Um, behind you. Or just one that's a great flex. I don't know. I don't. That'd, that'd be very difficult for me to answer that. That question. They've all got different meaning to me because of the friendships that I have. Um, I can, really can't answer that. The greatest piece that I have, though, is actually a chair from the Montreal Forum. That uh, I met a, a guy my age who was a salesman almost forty years ago, French Canadian. And uh, walked into his clothes store that he managed, didn't know, and we became friends, still friends to this day. And every suit I own, I bought from him. And um, the Montreal Forum closed probably 25 years ago, and uh, maybe a little bit more. And I uh, went up there in, in the summer, and he says, I have something for you. And I thought it was a, a nice sweater or something because he would would hold those because obviously Montreal is a little bit, you know, it's a summer town, uh, San Francisco, a little chilly in the summer, a little chilly in the winter. And uh, he had a seat from the Montreal Canadiens at the owner of the, uh, the, the franchise clothes store, had two seats and he was going to keep one. And he had a thousand friends in the province of Quebec and said, I'm going to have 999 enemies. What do I do? And my buddy says, I know who you can give it to. So that's my favorite item here because of how I got it and and the thought process that went into it from a dear friend in, in uh, Montreal. Um, What was the other question? Player, favorite player. Favorite player. In the game today. Maybe someone that wasn't that you like, maybe not a Dodger or not somebody that you necessarily were around, but just from afar, you admire their competitive spirit. Wow. That's a great question. 
I mean, you know, they're, they're probably going to be star players. I mean, the Grom, you know, <laughs> tough not to like that compete in the ability if he could stay healthy. Um, that was one of those questions after 40 years and after thousands of players and, and even staying in touch with everybody today. I need some time to think about that. Yeah, no, understandable. You know, I mean, a guy that, um, you know, and people are probably not going to like this, but, you know, Justin Turner, his journey, this man's non-tendered in his late 20s and goes to work goes to work and becomes a historic player for that franchise. One of the great players in that franchise and equally, if not more um, um, of a reason to feel this way is what he's done for the community. Unbelievable stuff. And not just writing a check, but really digging in and getting involved. So, uh, you know, he's going to be a Red Sox now for a couple of years. Um, Did you trade for him? I signed him. He was non-tendered by the Mets. And um, I signed him to a one-year deal for a million dollars. Uh, it was a major league deal. And then we did the physical. And the physical showed he had a bad knee. Called, talked to the agent, said, I need to talk to your client. And that is what I'm going to talk to him about. So I had the clearance to talk to him. I called him and I said, look, I've lost Jerry Hairston, Skip Schumacher, Nick Punto, Michael Young. Um, I need to get younger. I need to get somebody that can play all over the infield. You're younger. And I, you know, I, I know you can hit. And um, so we, we make a deal. I, I go from a, a major league deal to a minor league deal, which is quite a difference in the guarantee portion of it. And um, I call him and I says, you know, I'm going to have to change the deal because I, I can't give you a major league deal because you didn't necessarily completely pass the physical. Was this before or after the press conference? <laughs> <laughs> this was uh, obviously that if you've been paying attention way before, way before. And, um, and uh, you know, he, he you know, wasn't happy with the conversation, but I said, look, you know, we don't know each other. I said, how do you feel? He says, I feel great. My knee's not bugging me at all. I said, okay, I take your word for it. You take my word for it. You're going to make the team. If something happens to you, you're on a minor league contract. Something happens to you with an injury besides that particular knee. I'll cover you. I'll put you on the roster and put you on the, they call it the disabled list back then, now the injured list. I said, the knee blows, you'll stand in minor, the minor league deal until you're healthy to play. I said, so if you, if you feel how you feel and you're from, the, you're from Southern California and if you want to be a Dodger, you know, we'll, we'll, this is what we'll do. And he says, okay, let's go. So we signed him for a million dollars on a minor league contract. He's made a yeah. hundred cents. And, um, you know, he's, he's been a, an iconic player for that organization and got better at an age where players are at their peak. He, he started to get better when everybody else who was a really good player was already there at that age. A lot of credit because he worked. He worked and he took pride in what he did on an everyday basis. That's what I'm talking about. You know, it's you know my earlier point on this show about the 97 Giants and about how Saves does business, how I did business. We needed to know who the people were. And I knew this guy. He took a deal. He could have probably, I think he could have went to Boston way back when, nine years ago for maybe more money and a major league deal. But no, he bet on himself. And then when he signed, he went to work. And if the giant fans are upset with me bringing him up, then that's a compliment because you're upset because you know, he was a very, very good player. And, and that's tough to have a favorite better than that. When I go back to my giant days, love Jeff Kent, love JT, Richie, so many other guys. Kirk Reeder. I know very few pitchers who pitch with less stuff and won more games than Kirk Reeder. I thought you were going to say Mike Matheny. I thought you were. Uh, oh, Mike, uh, absolutely. And I was yeah. only there maybe a year or two with Mike. And then I went to LA. Um, but Kirk Reeder was a guy that, I mean, you talk about compete. Oh my goodness. Competed 
Oh, winner. Winner. I always ask myself, what if Dusty had started him in game seven yeah. of the World Series? Yeah. Michael Michio says the final 10 minutes of Ned has lasted one hour. This is free therapy. Thank you guys. <laughs> I gotta I gotta reveal something to Ned. I I was I, I was you know fired up when you got the GM job with the Dodgers, and it was really hard to root for you because it was the Dodgers. Yeah. But I had my own kind of angry feelings about the Giants at the time. <laughs> this was 2006. And a buddy of mine came over and um, he's like, hey, isn't your buddy the GM of the Dodgers? I said, yeah, Ned Cuddy, he's the GM of the Dodgers. He's like, man, they're on TV tonight. Let's let's watch them. And I'm like, oh, okay, so we're watching the game. And he's like, oh, you ought to, you ought to, you ought to bet on him. You ought to bet on it if uh, it's your buddy. And we, so we have something. To root. I go, yeah, okay, you know what? I'll bet on it. I'll bet on the do-. It was, it was September of 2006. It just happened to be the night that Kent, JD Drew, Russell Martin, and Marlon Anderson went back to back to back to back oh, against yeah, the Padres. And I'm just kind of wondering if you remember that night, Ned. I oh, never gosh. mentioned this to you. I mean, Marlon Anderson hit the fourth one out. Um, it was, was an amazing. Nice it too, was an amazing it? thing. It was Dodger Stadium. It was late in the summer, and the ball was jumping. And what a night to see to see that. And I just I, I've never mentioned that I had money on on the Dodgers that night. But uh, what was your recollection of that night? Because that oh, was a magical. lot of a lot of things. That game. And the game against the Dodgers when Brian Johnson hit the walk off. 97, the September 97. Two greatest regular season games I ever saw. And that, <coughs> excuse me, that day it was a four game series. And this was a Monday. It was one of those weekend wraparounds. And we were chasing San Diego. And we gave up like three or four runs in the top of the first and deflated everybody. And we just kept coming back, coming back, coming back. And we're four runs down in the ninth. And they've got Trevor Hoffman sitting out there. And boom, here they come, one after another. And we tie the game. And when we tied the game for one of the few times in my career, I was at peace with whatever happened because of the fight we had shown to come back from, you know, down throughout the entire game, off and on, fighting back, ninth inning, Hall of Fame closer. He ended up giving up, I think, the last two of the four. And, um, you know, we, we tie the game. Then what happens is I think Aaron Seeley, a dear friend of mine, as it turns out, one of the guys I hired after his career, gives up a run to San Diego in the top of the 10th. So now we're trailing again. And then I think maybe Kenny Lofton may lead off and get on, and Nomar hits a walk-off two-run homer. So in the last... Three outs of the game, let's say, between the ninth and the, the beginning of the tenth, we hit five home runs and scored six runs to overtake the Padres. Ended up tying them for the NLS. That's the team that I was talking about when we were talking about the '97 Giants. Right. The team that I inherited—that was my first year there—and the team that I inherited had lost 91. A lot of players that never saw daylight again in the big leagues, and we started to change it over with Billy and. And Nomar and Raphael and, and and guys at Kenny, you know Kenny Lofton was a tough character boy. He Great giant hated too. To lose. Great and giant. Second time I loved I, when I you guys got Kenny from the White Sox in in uh, oh, yeah. two thousand and two. Change our whole dynamic. Yeah, Ned, we're gonna let you go. Hey, this was Are you awesome. Sure? It's only been yeah, two I, hours. I know. Seriously, we gotta let you go because I you know <laughs> seriously, I mean. Uh, uh, your, you know, your grandkids are going to be in high school by the time this thing's over. Uh, <laughs> hey, I love you, brother. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for doing the thing. I know you were all over KMBR and and uh, and talk radio, probably up and down the coast. You're a great guest, and people love to to pick your brain. The great John Lund, you know, well, he does a show with Greg Pop on on KMBR. John Lund unleashed says, "Nice show, bro." John's in the house and enjoying this. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of Giants fans for a lot of Giants fans. Ned, as you know, it's a very passionate fan base. It's been a really tough 24, 48 hours. And this is in a lot of ways is like therapy. And, and you also kind of put a lot of perspective on this thing. So I just want to thank you for joining us on our show. Uh, you got the standing invite. We enjoyed talking ball with you all summer. I want to tell all 500 people in the chat, if you're in the chat right now, hit like, hit subscribe, 
Ned joins us from time to time. He'll be with us uh, again between now and spring training and and uh, a lot during the season. So, Ned, great stuff, man, and and happy holidays. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to, to you and the family and, and uh, the kids and the grandkids and uh, great things. I wish, wish you nothing but great things in 2023, my friend. Hopefully – We'll do this many times. Yeah, thank you, Ned. And I got I got one quickie for you. Oh, here Who, we go. Right now on December 21st, early prediction. We like to do predictions on this show. Who do you got in the World Series and winning it next year? As of today, I know it can change in the next come couple on, months. Dude, come on, come what do you, on. Do just this? a quick one. Who do you who, come off on, the man. top of your head? I mean, I can't, can't I can't give you that answer. Oh, Tony, just, 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 that for, just ignore him. Just absolutely uh, ignore that. The end. I just can't. Super Bowl I, I, might be. I, I need I need 30 seconds, Larry. Yeah, I want I want to thank you guys for having me on. And I want to I want to really tell the Giant fans I mean this in the bottom of my heart. I turned the Giants down when they first offered me the job way back in 94, I think. And because I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if it was the right organization, right place for me, and things like that. And then Brian and, and Bob Quinn convinced me to do it. And I spent 11 years there and it was, it will always be special to me. So, and I don't just say this, I got, you know, there's no, there's no reason for me to just BS you here. It means a lot that, that fans, you know, like this show and that fans, you know, re respect and, and are, are kind to me. And uh, it's just important. And it's one of the highlights of my life. And I still stay in touch with a lot of giant employees including last night, including today, you know, and I know what they're going through in a way, but uh, I just have so much respect for the organization, for the fan base, for the entire situation. I mean, I, I loved it there and um, it'll always have a special place in my heart. I mean, it sincerely, I wish everybody a great holiday, Merry Christmas. And um, you know, third place won't be that bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all right, brother. Hey, good to see you. Thank good you. to see you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks you, so much. Great Ned Gluddy. And we'll take Have him out one. right there on that. Oh, Calva awesome. Camigas is great show. It's always great to listen to Ned. Uh, lots of people in the chat saying Ned is the man. Unanimous uh, approval rating amongst the crew show, I think. Yeah. Eric Gomes says Ned is the man. Uh, too much says all love, Ned. Uh, yeah, great stuff. Oh, we even have a couple people in here. Wait a second. We got some really smart people in here. Mark Graves says mute Dan. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Now that was good stuff. And, and let's do this. Let's take a break. We'll, uh, we'll play some spots and then I want to get your guys thoughts on kind of the night that was 500 people in the chat hit like hit subscribe. If you're, we have, a, we have a brand new channel member. If you want to be a member, it's like $4.99 a month. We have Krug Show t-shirts. If you want to buy them, you can contact me. We'll get them sent out to you. They're $25 each. But, um, yeah, great night. A lot of I, – I, I don't know that we solved anything. I don't know that we got any concrete answers. I feel better um, for, for you know, having Ned on and, and getting that kind of stuff, but uh, getting that kind of breakdown. But we'll have a few thoughts from the three of us coming up next as we finish up. On a what night is this, guys? What is this? Wednesday, Wednesday night. Wednesday night. Um, Wednesday night. I lose track. A yeah, little Wednesday. Wednesday night edition of the Krug Show. More straight ahead after this. Larry Kruger here for Telmetrics. Thanks to Casey Bateman and the good people at Telmetrics. If you're an occupational therapist, if you're an orthopedic surgeon, a chiropractor, a physical therapist of any kind, uh, Telmetrics is designed for you to use in your practice and will greatly ben benefit your patients. Telmetrics uses computer vision and artificial intelligence and provides a platform for outpatient rehab therapy services, both in the clinical and the telehealth environments. So using Telmetrics can improve your patient's experience and much more. So for all your sports injury needs, or if you're a physical rehabilitation specialist of any kind, call and make sure you use telmetrics.co, T E L M E T R I X.co. And thanks to Casey Bateman and all the good people at Telmetrics for being a proud sponsor of the crew. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Dan Coach Emilio. Dan is a buddy and he is a phenomenal retirement planning specialist. And you can contact him today at securemoney.com or at his number, 925 62 
628-9966. There's a lot of uncertainty in our world right now, and you want to make sure that your money is secure. That is the key. Danny's got 25 years of experience, born and raised right here in the Bay Area, and he can help you get an immediate 10% premium bonus on your principal retirement account. So give him a call, 925-628-9966. He'll make an appointment with you, and you can sit down. It's not a one-size-fits-all kind of a deal. He'll consult with you and come up with a strategy to get you going to where you want to be. Once again, 925-628-9966, securemoney.com on the web. And thanks to Tony Casera and the good people at Casera's Italian Menswear. They are housing the Krug Show t-shirts, and they're a proud sponsor of the show as well. The Krug Show t-shirt, the Krug Show podcast t-shirt is available there at their store in Dublin. Their address is 7372 San Ramon Road in Dublin, California. And go see Tony Casera and get yourself a Krug Show t-shirt and support the show. And special thanks to our sponsor, New York Style Italian Sausage. That's right, NewYorkStyleSausage.com is their website. Phenomenal product, whether it's the breakfast sausage, the Italian mild, the Italian spicy, the chorizo. You cannot go wrong with New York Style Italian Sausage. Once again, NewYorkStyleSausage.com, often imitated, never equaled. We grew up with a Sunday dinner. That means no matter how busy you were, no matter where the hell you were, you came to dinner on a Sunday night. Yeah, Sunday dinner without sausage, it's like a a church without God. You know, how can you go to church if you don't believe in God? You know, and along with the sausage, also became the discussions. That was discussion night. You know, it, it wasn't a typical family that you sit there and you're quiet, you know, and you don't talk with a mouthful. Oh no, man. Italians talk when they're eating. Italians even talk when they're sleeping. And definitely we talk with our hands. So if we can't express it through our mouth, through our lips, we express it with our hands. So, uh, and that's what sausage is really. It's an expression, you know, that life is good. So New York Style Sausage was started over seven years ago. We are the largest producer of fresh Italian sausage on the West Coast. What makes our sausage in New York Style is really the recipe came from back east, from New York, you know, from Connecticut. If you look at all of our labels, there's maximum four or five ingredients, which we're really proud, we're really proud of. There's no preservatives, no MSG, fresh in, fresh out. The pork comes in fresh, goes out fresh. There's never any freezing throughout the process. We've always used fine quality cuts. We're never gonna deter from that. It's one of the reasons why our sausage is so good. I guarantee you put our sausage up against anybody else's from a flavor standpoint, no one will beat it, hands down. Hey, do yourself a favor and do me a favor. Go buy a package of the New York style Italian sausage. Guaranteed you will love it, guaranteed. Hey Pasquale, Dan Cochimilio here for the Krug Show. Just picked up for the very first time some of your New York style Italian sausage here at Sam's Club in Arizona. My wife just cooked it and I'm about to take a bite. Mmm, man, this is good. Pasquale, when you winked and said you guaranteed we love it, you're right. This stuff is absolutely amazing. Best sausage I've ever tasted. Thank you, Pasquale. All right, welcome back to the Krug Show. Larry Kruger, Dan Coach Emilio. Oh, wait, just give a band. Sorry about that. A band. 
finishing the rest of the night off. Um, good stuff with Ned Coletti and great, a lot of, a lot of great people in the chat here. Um, you know, basically I would just say hit like, hit subscribe. We're closing in. I, I believe we're closing in. Let me double check. I think we're closing in on 9,000 subscribers. Um, and you know, thanks to Ned for spending so much time with us. Yeah. We have 8,000, 8,686 total subscribers. So if you're in the chat, you're one of the, the 400 people in the chat still remaining here, uh, hit like hit subscribe. You know, it will just basically, uh, if you hit like and subscribe every time it, the likes, you know, kind of help the, uh, algorithm and help grow the channel. And then if you hit subscribe, of course, that, um, that will just alert you every time we go live, uh, you'll get an alert on your phone that we're going live and that will just enable you to uh, check out our stuff. And then if you want to be a channel member, it's four 99 a month. You can be a channel member as well. And if you'd like to have a, a Krug show t-shirt, um, we're selling them. Um, I just ordered, I think 52 or 55 shirts and I should have them before the end of the week. And a bunch of you, like 15 or 20 of you have already reached out and sent me your address just DM me on, on uh, Twitter, get a hold of me on social media, Instagram, whatever. Leave me a note. Tell me you want one. Um, I'll get your address. They're $25 plus whatever it costs to ship. And, uh, and there you go. And thanks for, uh, thanks for supporting the show. All right. What did you take out of tonight? Dan, Ryan, uh, what did you get out of this? You know, there's a lot of different things that we talked about tonight. Um, everybody kind of has their, their take on what they, they took away. What did you guys take away? Um, took away. I wish Ned was the GM of the giants. Yeah. <laughs> serious. I, I mean, serious. I wish they had professional guys running the organization that, uh, this stuff wouldn't happen under, his or his type of, his watch it just uh it never did happen under no. under him or Brian I've never heard of this stuff really happening to this extent in sports I know players failed physicals but I mean the day of the press conference <laughs> I mean that's what blows me away I mean Carlos Correa is supposedly dressed and ready to go and uh, to go on the radio with KMBR and then go over to the press conference. I mean, like, who does that? I, I just wonder, and, you know, I, I, Ned didn't want to speak concretely on this, but I just kind of wonder, what's the aftermath? What's the fallout? Because, you know, he Carlos Correa did put on a suit, did fly to San Francisco. Yeah. And I'm sure there's an awful lot of players that will look at it as, man, the Giants did him wrong. And does that mean that they won't be able to sign players? How do agents respond? I mean, Ned said, hey, look, if your best deals with the Giants and, you, you know, if your best deals with an agent you don't like, you know, you put it all, you know, you put all those 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 personal things aside and you make the best deal for your client. But I just kind of wonder if there is, is there any – aftermath is there any fallout from this uh especially for a team like the giants guys who really need to lean on the free agent market just to fill out their roster are they going to be able to do that like can they you know if they wanted will myers or eric Hosmer or, or some you know pitcher or roldus chapman are they going to be able to get those guys or are they kind of persona non grata among the agent world and they're going to have to overpay for every every acquisition all winter it, it, it looks like that um, I don't know. I, I really don't know what to say. Matthew Mears says Ned was very confused about what happened and talked about leadership and direction. That's what I got out of it. The Giants, la the Giants lack of leadership and direction. Fire Farhan Zaidi. He is not the guy. Rye, what, what was your takeaway? You, you, you've heard a lot of this. Uh, Romo says, is there <laughs> your opinion? Why no word from the Giants? I don't I, think, I don't oh. think they know what to say. Like yeah, it's a very difficult thing to kind of prepare what to say here. I think it's like a it's a really really sad thing, but I just I think that this team this this I, I like I even if we if they do fire Farhan, if you're a GM, why would you want to go there? I mean, clearly, I mean, I actually kind of believe that Farhan was in on this whole signing. 
I do think it was ownership that screwed it up. Somebody said they're like some of the minority owners, maybe Buster Posey, were uh, left in the dark about this whole situation. It's what, just, what part of it? I mean, that the, they were bidding on them, period, or that just that, like the, the medical the concerns and stuff. And I don't know. I mean, I I guess I'm at the point where do you believe that, by the way? Do you believe that they was derailed by medical concerns or is that a backfire and just an excuse to get out of a huge expenditure? Because look at the risk they took with Hanniger. Hanniger barely played last year. Look, at the, look at the injuries that some of the guys that they have added in the past. Have had, Stella, I mean, you know, Buster had a terrible ankle. I mean, now we're, we're supposed to believe they, I think they got cold feet on the yep. money and I think they got a cold feet on the money. I think when, when, when uh mad dog Russo tweeted out, that's the worst deal in franchise history. Some of the owners probably said, what worst deal in franchise history. And then, so I think that got their attention. Um, and then I also think that, you know, the price tag, uh, does it make him a competitor or, 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 you know, winner now? No. And then I think also, I believe this. I believe that the Giants, in that one week between when they announced it and when the press conference was scheduled to be to go off, I think that they saw in that week that an alarming small, alarmingly small number of people bought tickets. And I think they're looking at saying, wait, we're going to spend $350 million for a guy who doesn't move the needle, isn't going to make us a winner, you know, for 13 years, and he's not selling tickets in year one. Oh, my God, how do we get out from underneath this? I think they're the ones who push Farhan into it. I don't think he ever wanted to go down this road. I don't think this is his kind of player or this is his kind of deal. Um, I think they pushed him into it, and I think the owners got cold feet and found a willing uh, – person in Farhan to to back out and I think the Giants backed out the only way they knew how and I think the rest of this is just talk crap so like I think so do, I think isn't it like a close. it's it's a complete shit or get off the pot moment I mean it, this should create clarity you know are the are the Giants do they really truly Ned kept saying that you know you got to be honest in assessing yourself do they really truly believe that they can contend for a World Series that they can contend for the division that if they you know get Correa and then maybe add a piece of the deadline that they actually can be, you know, that team that won one Oh seven again, or do they realize like, look, the Dodgers are stacked. The Padres are stacked. The giants are absolutely the farthest away from stacked. They have no prospects. Um, you know, Correa getting Correa would just kind of be like a, a, a ticket attraction. I mean, at this point, I do feel like you got to just bottom out, do exactly what Ned was saying, yeah. uh, you know, sign these guys and just try and build them up and then flip them at the deadline. I mean, it's yeah. just so insane. Get that, creative. Oh, yep. my God. Rodon could have fetched so much. Uh, yep. It's we were insanity. all saying it last year. We all said it. Oh, my God. We were God. all pushing for it. Trade them, trade them, trade them. Um, I think what happened here is everything, the market changed on them at the, at the meetings that the, I don't think they were prepared for things to get so high. It started with Jacob deGrom getting five years. I felt like you drove the prices up at the meetings. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Me being there. That was it. I think they maybe thought they would go eight years on a shortstop for 30 million or something. And were willing to spend two fifty. And when they lost out on judge and then it was like, Oh crap. And then they signed. I think they got pushed into the deal by Boris took advantage, got it all the way up to three fifty. Um, they were probably well, looking. See, here's a big thing. I think I think that I think we all agree that the injury thing is BS. Yet the Mets actually offered one year less at a lower AAV. So that leads me to believe. I don't think that has anything to do with the injury. I think that 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 Boris totally swindled them. Yes. He knew how desperate they were. They way overpaid. Probably yep. either. Uh, Farhan or somebody in the, in the ownership, somebody got wind that, you know, the second highest bid was maybe that Mets offer. Like, you know, like a ye whole year less, way less money. And then all of a sudden they're like, well, you know, before you sign this, do you think you can kind of maybe see if we can't wiggle the, you know, negotiate the deal down just a little bit, you know, bring, bring up the injury, you know, use that as, an, and then, and then uh, Boris said, uh, oh, this is, I, you know, like, are you kidding me? You guys have no leverage here. Uh, we'll just go to the Mets. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, don't care. exactly. That's Not exactly what this. happened because 
uh, Steve Cohn came out Sunday night saying that he wanted in on the deal and he was willing to spend 300. He goes, I was go 300. I've got a lot of money. I don't uh, get, you don't get to be one of the best hedge fund guys in the world if you're not competitive. And he goes, and I'm super competitive. And so he was told by Boris that, oh, we're already too far down the, down the road with another team, you know? So then the giants do the deal. He, he got it. Boris totally got the giants to push it to 350. I can hear him say, Hey, look, you go that extra 13th year, bring, we'll bring the AAV down. We'll go 350 and you got a deal. Well, and, and I, do you think that Dansby Swanson, because people were saying, oh my God, you know, Dansby Swanson's the last shortstop left, last one standing. He's going to get an insane deal. And then he just got six for 177. Did he get They're, six or seven years? I think he six. got seven. Six for 177. Six, but maybe, maybe he could be right. Seven. Whatever. Six or seven doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, that's like just so reasonable for a shortstop to hit 25 oh, yeah. home runs. I mean, Giants could have had him for seven or eight years at 200 yeah. million. I, yeah. I, would, I wanted uh, Correa at eight years. At 13 years, it was like, that's five too many. I mean, the problem that's, isn't that's, so much. That's just, the, yeah. They, I mean, look they how pay, old he would be. Yeah. What are we going to throw him? I don't want a shortstop at 37, 38, you know, 39. I didn't have a problem. 40, with 13, 41. That's what they were signed up for. You know what? I didn't have a problem with the 13 years. And I said it the other night because of the AAV at 27. Why I didn't have a problem with it. The Giants need to start somewhere to get that first star. He Correa's the got the type of Godala. Yeah. Correa is the charismatic type of person who could bring a lot of other stars here. Now, the way they did it, they're not getting anybody in under this front office. No way. There's no way that any superstar would come unless he's getting 10 million more a year, you know, than any other offer he's got. Because this is, I mean, it, it, it's it's bad. I, I'm telling you, this is really bad. When Logan Webb retweets that and says "Amen," and Alex Pavlich says that he well, talks say, to well, read giants. that one again for people who missed that. Rye, do you have that? Can you put that back yeah, up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, why what was that again? Pull that up. Yeah, By Alex, somebody all on the chat also threw out Comforto and Ivaldi. Yeah, does, does that excite is, you in any way? Susan Slusser says she's heard that the Giants are in on possibly. Conforto, oh. who's another Scott Boris client. What's, what's up with Conforto? He didn't play all last year. Yeah, he was injured, shoulder surgery. So that that makes sense. The medicals, sign him. Yeah, I mean, they, you know what? I think that was the problem is that Correa didn't have enough of a medical. If he, he had more of like a Lustella slash Di Sclafani type deal, you know, like where it was like he was really injured the year before, that he, they, would, they would have definitely signed him. Okay, so now who's reacting <laughs> to who here? Gosman threw out the first one and when Go Webb? Gosman is subtweeting the Giants by saying – there is a fine line between dipping an Oreo for the perfect amount of time or having it break off into the milk. Sometimes Ooh, in I life, can, you I just remember gotta, those days. Oh, yeah, good. Accurate. Sometimes in life, you got to just take risks and be able to live with the consequences. And then Logan Webb said, can I get an amen? And he retweeted it. It's a pretty I good analogy. You, you got about you got about 15 seconds of dippage before that's going to break. You got on a Oreos? typical Oreo. Oh, yeah. On a typical us? Oreo. I would say 15 seconds submerged mm. and you got a chance to lift it and enter the pie hole anything over 15 seconds there's possibility you look up you lift that cookie and it's on the bottom of the thing and Does then the you fat get a content a factor in it all to this to the milk what <laughs> yeah, about a double that's oreo true, stuff? that's true what I mean, about a double oreo more, though more buoyancy Ooh, double stuff yeah. yeah double stuff what do you Ooh. think about that what how, how much time you got on a double stuff I, i'll say this the double stuff oreo is just awesome. I mean, that's just <laughs> yes, awesome. It is the. I mean, the. Have you seen the new Oreos that are even like they're less than a single stuff? They're like thinner oh, Oreos. Yeah, yeah. What I the heck's like that? Those. Give me. I like. Didn't they come out with a triple at one time? Or a triple a, stuff? Or a, not a double something? It's, it's probably than, outlawed in California, like catalytic double, converters. But now they got they got peanut butter. They got mint around Christmas. Sometimes do you well, like the any mint? Of the isn't other? bad. Yeah, I'll, have, a good one. The, I'll even go knock off Joe's O's at our Joe's. Uh, oh, yeah. Trader Joe's. You know, you can get kind of the Joe's Trader oh, Joe's yeah. knockoff version. Have you tried complete? They <laughs> they put out a pretty good one. <laughs> I know. Right, uh, we get oh. this one. Wait, let's see. Um, yeah, I, I read that. Oh, oh, go. 
Good. Okay, uh, since Farhan is co- this is some pizza diaper four ninety nine. Since since Farhan has come on with the Giants, they've missed out on Shohei Otani, <laughs> Bryce Harper, Arson Judge, and Carlos Correa, just to name a few. See ya. <laughs> yeah, and Carlos Rodon, you didn't trade, and uh, uh, Umgarner, you didn't trade. Yeah, I mean, uh, this they're not, is they're not building very well. That's for damn sure. Now this is this is really tough. This XL is be... suffering bastard. Great show tonight. Thank you. We're all XL suffering bastards tonight. Yeah, I tell you, it it does not bode not well. I I don't think I think there's more seagulls next year than fans. I really do. Yeah, the biggest dilemma is you know will the outfielders get crapped upon? I uh, I mean, do you think that may, maybe they can start counting seagulls as attendance? <laughs> seriously maybe it'll be like the quad of candlestick it's like it's like a, a measure of pride if you get crapped on hey, i'll tell you what would, look at I'll my tell shoulder you what man would, i'm a season ticket holder yeah <laughs> tell you what'll be a really good draw is bring out people for skeet shooting for those seagulls man oh, start <laughs> shooting them out of the sky that would right out of the stands <laughs> that'll bring a few people mm-hmm. seriously uh, I, I something tells me the PETA people may not like that <laughs> Um, well, you know, good stuff. I mean, all I got to say is we'll, we'll, we'll keep following the story. As you guys all know, Danny's a season ticket holder. I'm a lifelong so, Giants fan. So right. Did, are you, did you grow up a Giants fan? Or are you just subjected to Giants because you're on our live stream and you're a bear? I, I mean, were you an A's fan? Cause you grew up, you're an East Bay kid. Did you grow up an A's fan? Giants fan? What, what is your, Oh, I mean, I definitely went to more Giants games just cause my dad would always get work tickets. And then I would say, if I'm being honest, like when I was really, I mean, I was born in 95. So like the y- early 2000s, I was, I kind of liked the A's, you know, with Tejada and the pitching staff and Chavez. Those were pretty fun teams. I was kind of equal with both. Uh, um, ready to and be. then mute, mute them, mute them. No, em. no, no. But then, but then as soon, around 2008, I started like going in middle school to Giants games, like by myself on BART. Uh, with buddies, and then you know, 2010 was just unreal. I'm glad you said 2008 and, and not 2010 because if you oh, yeah, be, be one of those, uh, but I mean, 09 players. when like Timmy started getting going and like Cy Young, two not oh nine, right? Panda was pan, Panda, Panda was oh nine too, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. no, he was earlier than that. I thought, didn't, didn't Panda come up before oh nine, Danny? Mm. But he was well. I know he was up in, yeah. in spring training much earlier than that. Posey came I, up in ten, and um, Crawford came up in what, eleven or twelve. Eleven. Eleven. Yeah. Eleven. Jer, uh, Jaguayo fifty six says, "Here's two dollars." Giants have to figure out why top free agents don't come here. Yeah, you know, and, well, and it's going to be something to monitor going forward. I mean, look, <laughs> you know. That's that's the thing. I, I do think, uh, you know, for me, okay, let's look at the Giants right now. I'd pass on belt. I would go get Will Myers. I think I'd put him at first base. I think I'd go get Kirk Casale. <laughs> what would, and I would, what would you do up. if he brought, brought belt and Longoria back now? Oh, my God. <laughs> no, I, I would go get Will Myers, and I, that would be the first thing I would do, and I'd put him at first. I like Andrelton Simmons defensively. And I think they could use defense up the middle. I, I that I get no problem bringing in Anderson Simmons. He gives them another glove up the middle, um, and maybe even a better defender, really, than what uh, Correa was going to give you. If you really are about getting better up the middle, more athletic, Simmons would help you. Center field's the iffy one. I'm willing to trade Marco Luciano in a deal for the Pirates, Brian Reynolds, but I also would have interest in Ramon Laureano if I could get him cheaper from the A's. Or even a good defensive player like Christian Pache from the A's, um, I would consider doing that. Um, I would try to build up the pen. I would try to go after like an Aroldis Chapman, maybe trade for a uh, an Amir Garrett. Kind of go for the big power pen with Camilo Doval, and um, and that's what I would do. And then and then you know go into next year, you still got plenty of money. Um, if you can make a deal in the middle of the year for an Otani, do it. If you can't, maybe you got to f- uh, go after him in free agency. But I would learn from this year's free agency, and if I'm going after Otani, I'm making a big money preventative offer up front to buy out the entire period. Like, I'm going to blow you away with an offer, 
but you're not shopping it. Mm-hmm. You're not doing anything with it. You're either telling me yes, you're telling me no, and we're moving on. Um, and that's it. And if that's like Danny who's, said, ten years, five hundred million. Who's um, negotiating that, that? But I would do it. Who's negotiating that deal next year in the off season? Is it Farhan or someone else? It's a good question. You know, there years ago when Ned Coletti took over the Dodgers. Do you guys know who he took it over from? Um, um, let's see. The um, Do you remember who the GM was the year before Ned was there? I bring this up because it's a very similar guy to the guy who's the Giants GM right now. I'm trying to think. I should know that. Cam Panis. Paul D. Patet. Paul D. De Podesta. Paul D. Podesta. Paul D. Podesta, former A, just like Farhan, very much wow. analytical, driven, real think tank guy. Now he's really, at the Browns, right? Or he's... yeah, he switched sports. He's in football now, and I know Paul. Paul's a good guy. I I, I met him in the Canadian League. We were both scouting there at the same time. All I would say is, D. Podesta was really, really bright. I mean, he, he took a backseat to nobody intellig- intellectually, and I would say the same thing about Farhan. He's really, really bright. Um, but it, it baseball is still very much a people business and you needed the people skills of Ned Coletti to get that thing going. And if you look at the success that Ned had in LA, it far outshined what Dee Podesta did while he was in LA. Um, and I think, I think the giants at some point are going to have to pivot away from Farhan and onto somebody who's a little bit more of a people person who inspires a little bit more confidence from people yeah. in the industry, players, I just think agents, Farhan is a um, – Other GMs. Yeah, I just think he's more of a guy that is, like you said, analytical, intellectual, not a type of guy that is a hardline negotiator. I think he can easily get um, miserly, or in this situation he got taken advantage of. I just don't think – you know, he's the perfect, I don't think he's the right fit at all. I think they need a complete regime change to gain the confidence of other players and agents for the future. And um, another question I have for you guys is, will Brandon Crawford finish his career as a giant? Yes. Yeah. Oh, finish his career or finish this year? I, I think career. I don't think he'll finish his career as a giant because I don't I think he'll he's gonna play this year under contract and I think they're gonna let him walk at the end of the year. And I think he'll right. want to so play it. And, year and he'll keep playing. So if that's the case, I think so. If that's the case, if he wants to keep playing, do you think he I mean he seems like to me like a guy that wants to win? And I could see him going to management even maybe soon. Or at the trade deadline, if they're like way out of it and say, hey, look, I know it's my last year. I'm, I'm okay with you guys if you want to move me uh, to a contender. You know, I could see here. him. I don't know about contender, Dan. I could see him as part of a, a big trade in Arizona because he lives in Arizona. You know, what about, what about the Yankees? They don't really have a great defensive. That's a good one, too. That's a great call, Dan. He, in a lot of ways, he could be a poor man's Derek Jeter for them. Um, as just and, a real his, st- his solid, steadying influence in the and middle of the Derek, diamond. Derek Cole's brother-in-law is there. But you know what? They also have two young shortstops that may be better than Craw, and they may be better than Craw already. So that's that's the question. Pizza Diaper says, here's four ninety nine. dollars Would you trade Luciano for, for Reynolds? Before his injury, he was locked in, looked at as one of the more pure hitters <laughs> in the minor leagues, really hoping to see him in San Francisco. I would. I would because like why though at this point why like, would I do it? Yeah. Well, I mean, oh, you're right. I mean, it's it's like you no, would I you sell? I, I don't have a lot of belief that Luciano is going to be a special player because I don't think he's profiles as a shortstop. I don't think he profiles an in, as an infielder. I think he's all bat, and I like the bat, but I think he's three years away. He's had a lot of back problems. I think there's a very good chance that Luciano just becomes a good but not great major leaguer. And I would take that chance for Reynolds and see. If I'll I can tell you where Reynolds. he's going to play next year. I want more than Reynolds coming back for Luciano. I want, you know, I'd want to grow the deal and have it be a bigger deal. But um, you know where um, Reynolds is going to play definitely next make year. That yeah. My prediction is he's he's playing for the Dodgers. Reynolds. Yep. There's a proposed trade out there right now. Yeah. 
uh, for the Dodgers uh, in, you know, whether it's proposed by the Dodgers or it's just, you know, media driven uh, the, the Dodgers have the assets to do it. And they got yeah. guys that can, they can give them three ready-made uh, major leaguers that are, you know, going to be rookie rookies that are ready. Giants don't have anybody that's ready right now. Right. The yeah. only thing that would, you'd have to, you know, if the pirates were somehow intrigued about the upside of, of uh, Luciano, that would be the only thing that would maybe push the giants ahead. Jaguayo 56 says, here's two bucks. Would you consider jerks and pro far for the outfield? Nah, he's a jerk. I'm not a jerks and pro far guy. Are you? I mean, he's got talent. Once upon a time, he was a highly rated prospect. I see a lot of inconsistencies. Yeah. He's not a good outfielder. Um, that's not a, that, a very you know, good defensive outfielder. This is this is going to be interesting to watch though because we have it's uncharted territory. We have no idea where they're going. They're going to try to win back the fan base. They're going to try to do something popular. The deal that I would make, and I suggested it to Ned, and I've talked to Danny about this before, is I would the Giants don't have prospects, as Dan said, but they do have deep pockets. And I would go looking for the player that has a big contract that a team wants to trade, like a Javi Baez. Like um um uh you know Madison Bumgarner even, and I would take that money if they would include some young players with that player and bite the bullet, you know, add a guy like Bumgarner to your rotation as a fifth starter, take on that forty million dollars and for it get Paven Smith or get uh McCarthy the 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 corner outfielder or get you know the catcher. Uh, or get VAR show or get, you know, they got a number of young players. If you can get one or two young players by taking on 40 million of Bumgarner, I think that's a creative way to use your financial might in a year. I, I, here's another one. This is a good one. Michael Michio. This is a great name. Get Yelich. Christian Yelich has been, you know, he's regressed. He makes a grip of cash. You could probably get him because of the amount of money that he makes and how he's kind of backslid as a professional and just gamble. You know, take a chance. They're probably willing to get rid of Yelich. Um, you're taking a chance on a big contract guy who's not old, who could maybe find himself. I would look for those kinds of moves. I would do that. The other one is, a, this is an interesting one. Larry, would you approach the Red Sox and try to get Rafael Devers or Chris Sale? I don't know about Sale, oh, but Devers. Sale because Sa does Sale have a bad contract or something? Look, is that one but I mean, the Devers, they, don't, they clearly don't want to pay Devers. Uh, so I, I would definitely try to, I would take on a bad contract from Boston to see if I could get them to take, to throw Devers in. Chiguayo says, I'm depressed, please. I need the Pasquale wink. How about the wink? But I can get you a little Pasquale. You want a little Pasquale? I get you some. You want a little juice? I get you the juice. You like the juice, eh? The juice is good. I get you the juice. Uh, that's from SNL. All right, here we go. Uh, here is a little Pasquale. We grew up with the Sunday dinner. There you go. We grew up with the Sunday dinner. Um, all right, guys. We are two hours and 45 we minutes into this live stream. We got, we got this one. In the room. That's this is how about room. someone like A.J. Pollock? I think A.J. Pollock is going to be a giant. I really do. I don't know that he's the answer. I don't think he can play center field on a regular basis. I think he can play center field in a pinch. And I think he can play the corners, but I like him. And I think that makes sense. I do. And you can get Sean, it cheap. Hey, Sean Proctor just texted me. He says, phenomenal show. I need a shirt immediately. <laughs> What's that? What does he need? A shirt. A Krug shirt. A Krug show shirt? Yeah. Hey, yeah. Proctor, get me your address, bro, bro and I'll, I'll get one to you. And uh, someone says Wander Franco. They're not moving Wander Franco. Someone says Luis no. Robert from the White Sox. Get, uh, Corey Cooper. Corey, I love you, brother. Man, I if you could get Luis Robert. Oh, oh man, that would be really good. Haruki Hitoki says Matt Duffy. What do you think of a? I don't. I, to me, third base is the one spot where they got a bunch of guys. Yeah, they got they got three, four, five guys over there at third base that could play yeah. third base. Uh, we got this one from Mike Vaz. Great show, guys. Thanks for the therapy. It was good therapy. Yeah. Good 407 therapy. people in the room, two hours and 45 minutes into the live stream. Guys, you guys, uh, now we went to Niner camp today. I talked to Ryan. I talked to T Y McGill. We talked to Josh Johnson. Jo I had a really good conversation today with Josh oh, Johnson of the Niners. Okay. Love Josh Johnson. He went to Oakland tech. 
Um, really good guy. And then who is our third guy? That we, oh, we, Kalia Davis. Dude, I was at Niner practice today. Kalia Davis. Now, all these people have been listening to me talk about Brock Purdy, Brock Purdy, Brock Purdy, Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy might not be the biggest steal that the Niners even got in this draft. Kalia Davis? They took a guy named Kalia Davis. Kalia Davis is 6'1 and change, about 320. And he is fast, like really fast. Like he used to be a linebacker. This guy's going to be one of their great interior pass rushers fast. Is he Remember the one that was that uh, name, I keep Davis. asking you this. Is he the one I saw videos good today at practice? Uh, in uh, you know, right after the draft of him like catching balls and running like a fullback. Is he the one that no, that was that was, was Poe. Po. Oh, that's Poe. Okay. Yeah. And and we had we asked somebody today, was it today or yesterday? We asked somebody about underrated Niners, and somebody said Poe. Oh, we asked T.Y. McGill. Well, he said Nick Sakel and Jason Poe. Mm-hmm. Are his two underrated Niners? Oh, he goes um, up against him, I'm sure, in uh, practice, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, and they did. And then, and then the day before, I asked the O linemen, of course, and they gave me defensive players. So it's interesting. McCrary Ball and uh, uh, Quantrez Knight, I think, was the other one. So Phil Reitz, can the Giants get Larry Kerg? Hmm, who's Larry Kerg? Mm. Larry Kerger? <laughs> Larry, damn that Kerg! Kerg. All right, guys, good stuff. Uh, We're back in Santa Clara tomorrow for more Niner action. We're going going up. We went from 407 to 414. That's the Niners. Some people asking about live. Are we live? Yeah, we're live. We're live. We're We're live. live. That's that that guy right there wearing a Giants hat. That's not tape. We're live. See, I can I can eat. Um, this this guy up top who looks a little bit like a criminal with a, that, with a stocking cap. Yeah, sp- speaking that. of criminals and uh, therapy, I might need some couples therapy after this. <clears throat> now I've, like, I had my girlfriend flew down here and like today, you know, off to Niner camp. And then uh, directly after I went to the police station to make a statement and then just got oh. stuck there for like just waiting in the freaking thing for like an hour and a half. And then uh, got home right into a live stream. She's just therapy. like sleeping now. Oh, <laughs> like, no. oh. Call, call Ned for an intervention. Oh no. <laughs> hey, Rye, I, Rye well, hanging out with Ringo this 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 holiday season. Right. Mark hey, Grace is Merry Christmas, Larry, Ryan, and Dan. We've got this one yeah. from Corey Cooper. Wishing right. everyone here happy holidays. And Larry, Dan, and Rye, best show in the Bay Area sports scene. Thank Corey, you. we Thank appreciate you. you, brother. Thank you, Corey. Uh, hey, Ryan, Ryan says, let's keep, going, keep going, Keep going. Keep going. Um, what else? <laughs> we got a bunch. It's just amazing. Oh, uh, by the way, we've got this one, <laughs> Eddie K twenty four. So no Wotus. You know, I I texted Wotus this morning, and I had agreed. You know, Wotus had agreed to come on this morning, um, at ten o'clock, and I texted him, and we went back and forth, and I said, Hey, Ron, look, I texted you to ha- come on to talk about Carlos Correa and how he was going to fit into the Giants infield at shortstop and what you thought of Crawford as a second baseman as opposed to a third baseman. And I just want to talk baseball with you. It's not your job to front um, transactions for the organization. You know, he, it's just not his job. So we both agreed that, you know, it would put him in kind of an awkward spot. He works for Farhan. Farhan's his boss. And there's a lot of people that want to, we're going to say, you know, anti Farhan things and anti giants things. So I just didn't want to put Ronnie as a friend of mine in that position, but we did agree that he is going to join us. So um, he is going to join us. It's just, we're going to hold off by it for a week, maybe 10 days and just see where this thing goes and see if the smoke settles a little bit. And giants never, never make a statement. The only statement they made was we wish Carlos the best. Well, uh, that be hilarious. A- hilarious. I mean, could you <laughs> imagine? I mean, that's the thing. If we had had Wotus on today, he his statements would have been like their statement, right? Oh my because, god, I know, I you know, because they weren't making a statement. So, oh, with, so with, I didn't want to put Ronnie in that in that spot, and uh, but we will get him on in a couple of weeks, and hopefully at that point we'll talk about whoever the Giants have and his thoughts on this off season at that point. But I'm gonna let the smoke settle a little bit before I don't want to squeeze 
Ron's too good of a dude. And I, and I didn't, I didn't want him to have him on to ask him a bunch of questions about Farhan or about the giants negligence on this deal. I wanted to have him on to talk ball. And so I'm going to wait until we're, until we're going to talk ball and then I'll get, get him back on. We'll talk ball. So uh, Eric Hernandez says, great show. Good times. Giants off season. It's not our fault. Maybe that's the slogan for 2023. It's not our fault. I love, I love that. It's not our fault. <laughs> Could you imagine that? Giants baseball, little jingle. Like it's not year. our fault. No, 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 it's it's like, but it's the Goodwill hunting scene. <laughs> it's not your fault. No, no, I know. No, it's not your fault. Uh, like last year it was Gabe, but you know, taking the field, the Giants taking the field, and they had all this dramatic music, and it was game up. This year it's it's not our fault. <laughs> Uh, I wonder how many. If it was my choice, he would have done the physical yesterday. Hey, here's another thing I thought of, but but I, you know, I didn't have, you know, Ned was giving such great answers. I didn't want to keep, I didn't want to interject, but you could have, I think you could probably, if you know you're going after certain guys for big contracts like Judge, Correa, or anybody else, I think you can ask for the insurance like after the season ends when they become free agents. So you're doing, you know, you could have done Ahead that. Of time. In, yeah, you could have done that in yeah. uh, first of November, you know. And because you're, first of all, I don't buy that. I do not buy that. The insurance on a contract of that are that's hundreds of millions of dollars is not like one of these. Oh yeah, by the way, it's a major component in the deal. You're yeah. not waiting till the eleventh hour to see if you can get insurance. Right. I, mean, I, I just don't buy that at all. I just yeah, you could mind. you you could go because you got those medicals are all out there with the agents for the guys that are free agents to look at. So they could have went ahead and call, I don't know. I know Lloyd's of London used to do those big deals on uh, yeah player Mariah stuff Carey's like voice yeah and all that. So guys, let's bolt for the door, but let's play Frank's song. And also, is there a way you can play it so I can hear it this time? I don't know. Last I couldn't hear is it the other sometimes time. the sometimes. It, I don't. I don't know if you remember, but at the beginning of when we first were doing the show, it was happening a lot to you, where like the intro or like the outro, you couldn't see it or couldn't hear it or something. Yeah, but it should. It should work. Let's hey, see. I've if we got can play. a. I've got a video you, for you guys later some no, night. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not, Can't do it tonight because I gotta like trend. I gotta like change it okay. from a dot mov or whatever. I have to show you a video sometime. I I was viewing was some old videos though. and I um. It's on my phone because I didn't know how to. But I I jumped the fence at Double Day Field at the Hall of Fame on the <laughs> baseball field. It, this was 1997, so 20 what six 25 years ago. It's a, it's hilarious. I jumped the fence and I run around the bases and uh, <laughs> it's just you slide slide no, down. No, but I was moving pretty good actually for uh, back, you know, compared to now. <laughs> Nick says, thanks for getting my question to Ned in, guys. Have a great night. Um, let's see what else here. I guess your show ends at 1 a.m. <laughs> no, it's going to end right now. We've 11. been going, we've been going for almost three hours and it's time for me to go have a snack. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I can't, I can't have this finely tuned uh, body I need, you know, I need to have a snack. I mean, I have just a full habit just on the by ground. Way, Ooh, wow. This might Those be the first burgers. live stream. This might be the first live stream where Danny has not eaten a thing. I did have a Snickers bar. One of these did little, you? just real quick. Yeah. You didn't even see it. Let's 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 uh, let's see a little faith. Let's see a little Buster. Let's see some Ringo. Let's play Frank's song, and then Not let's yet. get out. Thanks to everybody. We're gonna have another live stream talking Niners coming up. We'll play our locker room interviews in the days ahead. Uh, as Texas, Larry needs a spicy sausage. Thank hey, you. I had a I had one tonight. I actually had a dog. We did too. I put we it too. on we the bun. Spicy this, sausage. I put it on a bun this time. You know. There you go. <laughs> so, Better on a bun, huh? Oh yeah. So just holding it. Well, that was like just kind of like champion and you're a showman champion. you're a showman show, that was a showman deal yeah all right was... can we can we play him out with a little dog action little uh little yeah. buster a little faith a little ringo thanks to there everyone like and subscribe if you're in the chat for the first time um you know check you us out we do this all the time this is our buddy frank red who's a freestyle rapper and a song that he just released have a great night everybody peace you're not responsible for somebody else's thrill your integrity's intact and you're still trying to climb the hill.
was a lonely man. I never thought it would come true. But sometimes in life, all you have are your dreams and you. That's when you realize that life ain't standing still. And all you can do is bow your head and accept God's will. But it's funny how it makes you feel. Small talk, he didn't mince words, just some the lyrics to the best song he ever heard. All his hopes and dreams had turned to despair. But what he was facing, there was no way to prepare. This came from a man who thought his life was ending. In his mind, it was serious, there was no pretending. He checked the clock on the wall before he said his goodbyes. He made tears, he has gone, see back into his eyes. He was old in life, there'll be no encore. He raised his hands to the heavens, put his knees on the floor. Don't have to be a genius to know he'd been blessed. He said he'd pay it forward and always do his best. At that moment, what he's been searching for became clear. He was here to serve those who live in fear. With this newfound enlightenment in the wind at his back, he's prepared to live out his life's final act. He was a rich man now. He had purpose in life. And to capture this feeling, you don't pay a price. Before we set up on his own, he made a pledge to get some wins and live his life against the grain to the bitter end. You miss a shot at life. You think there's nothing else for you to do. This ain't a tragedy, son. I know I've seen a few. You're not responsible for somebody else's thrill. Your integrity's intact and you're still trying to climb the hill. Need it? I was a lonely man. I never thought it would it. come true. But sometimes in life, all you have Take are it. your dreams and you. Take it. That's when you realize that life ain't standing still. And all you can do is bow your head and accept God's will. It's funny how it makes you feel. Hey.